Hey, so um, uh, good morning. 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 Yeah. How are you? I'm good. It's like five, six hours before I usually wake up. It's the I'm on a terrible sleep schedule right now. That's but, that's unhealthy. Why? I, it's whenever I'm like not on a show. Like I just got back from Vancouver, and it's it's like I'm very disciplined when I'm working, and I, I get up at the right times. I go to bed early, and as soon as it's like okay, you're done with the job, everything goes to hell. Like <laughs> hygiene, <laughs> diet, sleep. <laughs> <laughs> the way I can just drop everything in every discipline, it's scary. But um, yeah, so it was, but it's nice to be up and, and, and see this time of day. Well, well welcome, to, uh, welcome to evening in London, morning in Los Angeles. Are you enjoying being back though? Because you've been away for a while. I think you've only just got back, haven't you? I, it's, it's, it's been a bit back and forth. Um, uh, this year, I've actually been home a little bit more, but um, I was doing a show called Midnight Mass with Mike Flanagan. Uh, um, we started that. Oh, uh, actual filming was from about August to Christmas. Um, but because of the pandemic, we got hit a day before filming. So oh, shit. Yeah. So, and I was on Bly before that. Um, <clears throat> and so as I was filming Bly, which was again in Vancouver, um, somewhere around the first few days of working with Mike, he kind of started like looking me up and down and sizing me up and <laughs> asking me questions that I knew didn't relate to, to Owen or the character. And I was like, what's this about? And then a couple of months later, we had a meeting and he, he pitched me Midnight Mass and was like, this is going to be two, almost three weeks after you wrap Bly. So it's going to be a real fast turnaround. Wait, between, um, between Bly and Midnight Mass, you were going to have three weeks off? Yeah. yeah. So three weeks to get into the, to leave Owen behind and yeah, get into and, the new character. And get into the new character. Yeah. And that seems unusual. As, I mean, it was, it was because Mike was so on Bly. So Hill House and, uh, was, every episode was directed by Mike. Mm. And I think it nearly killed him. Uh, <laughs> and he talks about the, particularly the episode where um, it was five, scenes five like those those oneers he was doing um after that i think then mike went and did doctor sleep yeah um which was yeah which was incredible and uh yeah i absolutely adored that movie but um he then when Bly came around was like i'm a show run and we're gonna i'm gonna pick my list of like top indie filmmakers and give them an opportunity to do an episode each so he does the pilot to set the tone and then mike yeah. went into production of midnight mass so for him it was like an easy turnaround and and there wasn't a huge crossover of cast between blind manor and midnight mass so there was only one or two of us i think who who had the three-week prep but I already knew about the role somewhere around about November. So I was kind of, my mind, I'd already, this isn't great to admit, I'd already mentally checked out of Bly. Um, <laughs> and I was already concentrating on mass. But, um, but yeah, and I had like, I think I can talk about it now at the time. Um, I lost a ton of weight for Owen, um, which was a, a, a choice I had made because I felt, it all kind of worked out. What I wanted was um, because he's caring for his mother, I felt that he'd have very little time for himself. Mm. So he'd probably be eating a pot noodle, if that, <laughs> even though he's a chef, you know. Um, so I wanted to be quite slim. And then I also once, because we were shooting uh, episodes in order, as soon as his mother died, I wanted him to look like he was eating a bit more and having a bit more time for himself. So there was a slight weight gain. Uh, but then when I spoke to Mike about mass, we spoke about a big weight gain, not muscle, a big weight gain. And as soon as I wrapped Bly or I was getting to the end of Bly, you can almost see it. I put on about 30 pounds of fat and, and I did it the dirty way. I didn't do it like there was no nutritionist. It was like method acting for well, idiots. What were you eating? What was it was like... McDonald's, man. It was, it, there would be like a DoorDash <laughs> order at four in the morning. It'd be like a McFlurry and a double cheeseburger. And like, it was, it was awful. And I, 
I started having health issues, no shit. And uh, really, that's <laughs> right. It's crazy. If you eat McDonald's three times a day, it it uh it definitely had takes its toll. I started having like I'd wake up in the middle of the night and like be choking on my own stomach acids. Oh my god! Yeah, and I was like, oh. <laughs> so I was carrying around all this extra weight, and and then um, we get to like the table read of Midnight Mass, which is in Vancouver, and we're there, and I'm heavy. And, um, uh, like we were going to shoot. So I think the, the table read was a Thursday and then we were starting production first scene on Monday. And that Friday was March 13, which was when, when we woke mm. up, I had the, the, the emails and the calls and the voicemails, <clears throat> which was like, Hey, we're going to shut production down for two weeks, uh, because of COVID-19. Um, and some people opted to stay some people I, I had i don't know my my spider sense was like no I get out of town quick um so within a few hours i managed to get on a plane and get to los angeles and then we didn't start production until august um but we were always kind of like we were one of the first shows ever to go up so it was this huge thing where netflix and sag and everyone were trying to like and the canadian government had to create the guidelines that were possible uh, and we were going to be almost the guinea pigs for that um so the version of the uh pandemic shoot that we did was very extreme like super sanitized like the things that are now myths about covid like we yeah. were in the thick of it like you know don't blink near someone or you know it was <laughs> it was intense but um during that period there was like three three months down three to four months down, I couldn't hold on to the, to the weight because I was always told we're only a few weeks away from production. We got a few more weeks, maybe a few more weeks. And that went on for three months. So, so what you lost it again then? Well, or... I, I asked, I couldn't do it, man. I, my, I just couldn't keep that up. <laughs> and, and so I texted Mike and I was like, Hey, can we, can we rethink this? And he obviously he was game. He probably didn't even want me to put on weight in the first place. He he's just a very supportive person. And and I was like, can I can I be trim? So I had to re lose it and then put on muscle. So this is like this is like method acting for dummies. So no one <laughs> saw the weight gain. It didn't play into the character. I ended up just going back to something a little bit more fit. So it was a a, a big journey, but it was worth it in the end. Wow. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's an intro, right? <laughs> it sounds incredibly unhealthy, but yeah. you know, it, for the cause, man, for the cause, because Midnight Mass. I mean, you know, you mentioned a lot of them there. I'm a, I'm a huge Mike Flanagan fan. Mm. I mean, like, you know, right back to like Oculus, um, Gerald's Game, like Gerald's what, one game, of those, yeah. one of those Stephen King adaptations that's arguably better than the book it's based on, um, and then Haunting of Hill House and, and Blind Manor. I mean. Look, it's weird, and I'm not just saying this, but when I think back to like my experience of watching Bly Manor, like I always do think back to Owen, your character, because I really do think he was the he was the heart of that show. He was um, a really interesting person in so much as he was both steadfast and incredibly vulnerable at the same time. Yeah. And how much of that was on the page? How much did you bring to that when you read it? Was it all there already? Honestly, it was all there. It was, it, it was a really strange job for me, man. Um, I, I stuck to the assignment uh, in a way that I don't think I've ever done before. Um, prior, it was, <clears throat> for, you know, prior to Bly Manor, my first show that gave me my sort of big break and got me out of, you know, the situation I was in and over in Los Angeles was I zombie for the CW. And that character was very much like a, um, a Sheldon Cooper type where I definitely didn't stick to the assignment. I was improving and kind of upstaging and trying to, I was new. I had a point to prove and you know, I was supposed to be a supporting character and I never really took that role <laughs> seriously. It was like, look at me, look at all the funny things I can do. Oh, uh, Ricky Gervais impression. And um, after five years of that and kind of feeling a little bit uh, selfish and I don't know, I, I, I just didn't, I appreciated the, the show and I'm still very proud of the work we did, but 
you reflect, right? And you're like, well, what can I do better? And when Bly came along, I auditioned for that. That wasn't like a, I wasn't specifically asked or offered that. Um, so I just, I just auditioned, played a little, a very vague sweet boy. Cause you don't really get much info when you do the auditions. Um, and then when I had my first meeting with Mike, he kind of asked me what I'd like to bring to it. And I kind of said to him, actually tell me what to do. Um, <clears throat> I, I already kind of understood from the page that his scenes or scenes that involved him were the lightest of the show. Um, and we had already discussed that with most homes, the kitchen is the heart of the house, right? That's where mm -hmm. usually a lot of the, yeah, yeah. When you, place. of course, when you're growing yeah. up, like all my memories come from family meal times. And exactly. So right? And, and it's the first place you kind of like, you come home from school, you throw your bag down, you go in the kitchen, you grab, so you know what I mean? And you might mm -hmm. pass your siblings or you, whatever. So, um, and then I also did the reverse of iZombie. So I went, this show isn't about you or your little scenes or your little <laughs> jokes or your little <laughs> looks in the background. So just be the best supporting character you can possibly be. Be the best supporting actor and be the best character for that. So be open, be welcoming, play scenes with, the, with simplicity and it, um, just be there for everyone else. Just like what the kitchen should be, what the chef should be. Just mm. feed everyone and be there for them and listen to them. So I just stuck to that assignment, really. Um, and it wasn't rewarding. You know, as a, as a job, it wasn't rewarding. It's not like I walked off set every day high-fiving and everyone was like, be dude, you nailed that. Because you weren't... Because... You were just doing what was asked of you as opposed to yeah. like doing something spontaneous and in the moment, something that, I mean, you, I mean, cause I, I guess with improv, there is that thing like where you, you have come up with something off your own back and it exists mm. in that, that flash of a moment when it works, it's all yours. You created it. You were like, mm -hmm. I just dropped that into a scene and that's going to be the standout moment of the scene. Yeah. It's well, in terms of improv, but I didn't, again, I, <laughs> there I was mean, flexibility to do so. I didn't. Okay. I was just very kind of, it's, it's a really strange thing to say. It's like, um, I just did my job and, uh, kept things simple and, you know, any scene was just about the bigger picture rather than looking mm -hmm. inward, which is, I spent five years looking inward on iZombie. So I kind of wanted to take a step back, mature and go, okay, you don't need to prove to everyone that you need to be here anymore and, 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 you know, do backflips. There's, there's a version of that with acting. Do you know what I mean? It's like yeah, a football yeah, I, almost doing too many skills. Yeah. Just play the game, you know? Yeah. And I guess, I, I mean, I can, it's weird that you sort of say there was the opportunity to improv. I mean, on, uh, on Bly, because to my mind, improving is sort of not fucking around, but just yeah. sort of being bigger than perhaps, uh, he, he, the scene requires i guess in i zombie it's based on a comic book and yeah. and so it, it is so it's a high energy mm -hmm. you know there's a there's a lot going on it's like snappy cuts here cuts there so that feels like it lends itself to absolutely improv yeah. if it, i guess your castmates are like definitely improv in this as opposed to going what are you doing well improv like, wasn't allowed on i zombie oh really yeah <laughs> rob thomas uh, is damn if any actor out there wants to like get the best kind of like training outside of drama school work for rob thomas uh you pick up so many good habits and he he asks questions of you man that like just cut right through you in in the most kind of like sweet way but um now rob's <laughs> like i'm funnier the the writers wrote this i don't need your alt lines that's the line on the page make it work and that's a skill in itself so for five years for most of us now if, if any of my eyes zombie co-stars saw this interview they'd be like he's lying because he he fucked around and said what he won all the time i did have this tiny leeway that the other kids didn't have mum and dad gave me a tiny bit more leeway and i think it was because i was british so a lot of the times i would look at the script and say ah i need to rejig this we don't say trash can, can I say this? Can I do that? So there was, that's where we started. And then because he was the kind of comedic relief, 
sometimes there is an alt or something there that in the moment might actually be funnier. So, so I did have this tiny leeway that no one else had, but for the most part, we, <clears throat> we almost entirely stuck to the script. Um, I remember I wanted to make a change once and <clears throat> it was something so superficial, man. It was just like something someone does in season three when they're like, Hey, I want to limp, you know, mm. it was just like one of those things. And I sent a message to Rob and I got this email back that was like, Hey, um, I'm not fussed either way. If you want to do this for season three, uh, however, um, I don't care, but if, if I did care, care, here's my problem. And it was like two pages <laughs> of basically saying, does this serve the character or does it serve role? Are you, is this really hand on your heart? Something that you want that's going to um, move it forward, that's going to round it out, that's going to do something? Or is it just because Rahul's bored and he wants to play a tough guy or he wants to do this? And again, this is like my first show ever. And it was a sweet email. But I was just like, fuck. It was it was completely superficial, man. It was total wow. it was total vanity. So by the time I got to Mike, mm. it's almost like he got this this kid who, you know, had really strict parents and and, was, and he's like, Hey man, this is a sandbox. Like, what do you want to do with the character? How do you see it? And I'm like, anything you want, sir. Um and that kind of worked. Um the the only thing that I did contribute was and it was a tiny bit of a fight was the mustache that's what i did bring to bly okay yeah so that was that was that's all you then that's 100 percent. i can take credit for that and know that i won't they won't get upset with me they they wanted i think mike was really happy with the beard that i had and i, I was like hey um i looked at some pictures of my dad and his brothers in 1987 1985 everyone yeah. was rocking the tom Selleck. yeah 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 so i um I asked for that and there was a, that Mike was on board. There were like my other producers were a bit like, Ugh, I hate mustaches. Um, were they worried that because it's a kind of iconic look that we don't, I mean, obviously it's a period piece. Were they worried that mm. it was going to get, it was going to steal the scene that people were going to be like, honestly. Yeah. Yeah? yeah. Really? It's, it's, <laughs> yeah, it really, because it, 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 it was, it's a little bit, it, when you do period stuff, there's, um, I mean, you can, obviously you can fully commit, right? But there's still an element of the... You are watching it in the modern day. Hmm. And some things are ridiculous. And like, say you had a, a protagonist who was this, I don't know, macho police officer, detective guy. Um, and you decide to stick to the times and he does have a mullet. Or he's got... Do you know what I mean? Something that was appropriate at the time that we we would view then as cool. Oh, it's like watching, you know, Michael Jackson's Bad video. None mm. of those dudes look bad. <laughs> I don't know if that, and I'm assuming they did look rough. I, I don't know if they did. I don't <laughs> think they look, <laughs> I, I don't remember being a kid seeing bad and going, geez, those guys are scary. Okay, what about Terminator? The first punks that, that come up to him, like. Yeah, Bill Paxton's one of those, Bill isn't pa he? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. That's um, not intimidating by today's standards, right? Yeah, all right. That's, that's, a, that's a good one. Yeah, I mean. Yeah, he's got a knife. That's pretty scary. But of course, uh, like just in his in terms of his fashion sense, no, no. But right. I mean, it's difficult to gauge because they're standing opposite a naked Arnold Schwarzenegger. <laughs> so I mean, you know, the, the sort of the, I don't know how you look scary when you're faced with that. That is the scariest. That's one of the scariest sights I can imagine you could ever see in 1984. Absolutely. Like a, a, a top of his game, Arnie with like his schlong out, like standing in front of you. And he's Austrian, he's not even, and he's in America, right? Yeah. So it's just weird, naked, foreign dude. <laughs> um, but you know, you know what I mean though? Like, that was, uh, was going to be the other, the other title, I think. Yeah, weird, <laughs> naked, foreign dude. Yeah. This works for this video. I'll take the <clears> top <throat> off, that could be our title. Um, <laughs> but, but yeah, I, like, there's it, it, there is this kind of this, this this line to toe where period, like like you said, and I think the moustache, it just I just remember it being a conversation, and because again I'm I'm very I, I don't really like to fight for stuff too often mm. unless if it's if it's something I genuinely believe in then I'm down for it, but for the most part if I get any resistance or, ne or you know what I mean I'm immediately like 
cool, we'll lose it. And I've just, that's something I've picked up. So if it's like, hey, I want to do this. And they're like, ah, nine times out of 10, I've dropped it before they've even reached their conclusion. Um, mm. The moustache kind of stuck for a bit and 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 it, it did finally make it. And then I had this thick fucking thing. <laughs> and I don't watch dailies. I don't st- I stay away from Video Village. It's my because own. It's- Because it might put you off yeah and i think it's for me it's it's it there's an element of trust i like to to give directors um that for me again this doesn't speak ill of anyone else there are some technicians out there and i've worked with them who who go to the monitors and double check stuff mm. and really kind of craft and go let me go back let me go back i can I, wait I, I, when, I, when you when you when you when you say technicians, you mean actors who are uh, who are quite obsessive with the sort of technical side absolutely. of their performance, Absol- right. Absolutely. right? Right, right, right. Yeah, they're, they're, they 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 there's so many different. You meet so many different types of of actor, and no one's method is the same. Um, so for me, one of the things that I've tried to um, adhere to is this idea that you are the director, right? Um, we move on when you're happy. I'm here to trust your, you are, you are flying the ship, man. I'm a passenger. Um, if you say it's good, it's good because I've, I've been there where man, like, how do you gauge what's good? How, how do you, as an actor, how do you gauge that you were good in the scene? Cause <clears throat> I've seen stuff where there are days where you, you are high-fiving each other, where you mm. walk away as, as actors and you're like, Oh, Oh my God. We felt that, like I, I was, I felt physically sick, or I was moved to tears, or, or you could feel the energy in the room and the crew feel it, and everyone just feels like they did a solid day's work. And then you watch the scene, and it's so fucking meh. But how? How can that happen? If it, I mean, I get it on an individual level. Like for example, mm. if you sort of, if you think to yourself, I've, I've, I absolutely nailed that scene. Mm-hmm. I've never been better. And you watch it back, and you might have done, but if the other people. The, uh, your co-stars weren't uh, up to scratch in that scene. It wasn't a good one for them. Then sure, the whole scene, I, I, I'd probably watch it and go, meh, that didn't work. But if you all, if all of the actors on set are going, we, we all nailed that, how, how, can, how, can it then not, uh, how can it then not actually work out? Because at the end of the day, like, <laughs> I mean, they're, they're, they're obviously big, entertaining, flashbang, wallop kind of scenes. But there are even just scenes where it could be like a meet cute, right? And you both feel it, like you feel it. You're you're running your lines, and there's a mm. chemistry and there's an energy to it, and you both feel like it was a great scene. And you watch it after it's gone through the process, and it's in context of the rest of the episode or the film. There are so many other layers that happen. By the time it arrives, you really might just have enjoyed the process of shooting the scene. That doesn't necessarily mean that the right. scene itself benefited from any of that extra stuff that was there on the day, that tangible stuff. And when you finally arrived to that scene, you're like, oh, mm. yeah. It looked just as good or it felt just as, everything else just felt like it, it wasn't this standout moment in the, in, in the episode. So it's, right. and I've had the opposite where you've, You've had days, man, where you want to quit and you're like, I felt nothing. My monologue on Bly Manor felt fuck all. Nothing. Wow. <laughs> Two tapes. And it was like the least, it was, it was just because of the way we were shooting that. And we were really outside. That was in the studio. So we were, you know, we had light and we, we had a long day to, we had a long night to get a lot done on that, around that bonfire. I remember the monologue was like two takes. Um, you only did two. I've, I, did you want to do another take after that? Or were you like... We moved on on the first take and I said, stop. I was like, let's, let me, let, let's have one for safety. Because mm-hmm. the director at the time felt that I, they were really happy with the, with the monologue as it was. Um, and I was like, I would like a... That was me just covering everyone. I was just like, let's get one more. I'm down for mm-hmm. one more. But that scene was like... Which did they it, use? I have no idea. Oh, you couldn't tell. No, I'm no. so detached and there's so much time passes. I'm like, eh, uh, like yeah. I, I, I barely can remember. I can, I'll only remember stuff if there's like some sort of improv flair or I added something that was off the page, then it, you know, but I usually, I, 
my stuff usually looks like the, the same from take to take to take bar a few differences so i yeah once it's in rehearsal and we've blocked in they like it i tend to kind of just improve what we've already done rather than here's a complete alt take that's wacky i, I don't really do that but um but yeah like that 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 one was i didn't feel anything like it was just work you know and, and this is the monologue i prepared there you go finished and then we moved on no one made a big deal we just were like right now we gotta do this one and then when the show came out and uh, you start seeing press and I'd see, you know, a little mention of the monologue or this or that. And you were like, huh, isn't that weird? But there are other scenes that were like on the day we were like, whoa, <laughs> mate, no one cared. So it's, it's, so it's one of those things like you like, so when going back to why I don't watch dailies or sit in video village, I, I can't be objective and I don't know what, I do with that information. Like, I didn't feel anything, but it looks great. I felt something, but it didn't look great. I don't know. So it's it's best for me that I just sort of like, I hitch my wagon to my director and I don't second guess them. There's also a, the, one of the most important people on a shoot uh, is the editor. Um, and as I've gone on, I've realized just how much they, <laughs> they save us. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so there's no point even getting into that. The amount of genius behind an editor and what they can do and how they can save your ass. And uh, there's so much out there. Um, so there's this like idea of like, who am I to sit there and go, no, 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 no. Let's do another. Um, yeah. I, I, you know. I guess it's true. I, I mean, it, it must be nice though to have built up that trust like with Mike. I mean, I guess, I guess you'd seen his previous work before Blind yeah. Manor. And so you were like, this guy knows what he's doing. And mm. then you meet him, you create the character together, you talk it through and you build up that trust. And I think it's amazing what a talented man he is and such a bloody nice guy as well. I, I met him for Dr. Sleep. I, I did the oh, Q&A sweet. for that when they, um, when they, uh, God, I don't know, when, when was it now? COVID's totally screwed up my this would ability have been 20, to judge time. I think he was doing press for it 2019. 2019, so it was the end yeah. of 2019, yeah. Autumn, yeah, yeah. It, it's, it must be cool. I mean, you're a bit younger than me, but like I'd say we have a lot of the similar uh, pop culture reference points. And talking to Mike, he has exactly the same ones. Does. And to work with someone who you can have a, have a shorthand in terms of pop culture references yeah. must be quite good. Yeah, that's that for sure. I, uh, without giving too much away, without that, I'll be able to talk about it when Mass comes out. Um, mm. But I got to experience that where, when we were talking about the character and character design, I got to send something from a video game mm. as a reference. And Mike was like, fuck yeah, I love <laughs> that game. That's what I want. And, you know, like, that was an awesome, I was like, okay, we're on the same page. And I don't have to like, like, you know, I don't have to just look at films from, I don't know, seventies or whatever, even though, you know, I grew up watching movies from the sixties and seventies, but yeah, like it's, he's, he's a savant when it comes to film and it's fascinating. I think even recently I, I, I was interviewing him for this um, Netflix geeked week and Mike graciously came in to, to sit on a couch while we played resident evil I just mentioned Jaws mm. and he broke down the jump scare of the, you know, the, the, the boat when they're scuba diving and then the, the yeah. head pops through and. Oh, the broke, ben, ben Gunn's head. Yeah. That's yeah. It, yeah. Ben Gunn's yeah. head. Yeah. And he just broke down something so small where he was like, ah, well, you know, the, the noise, the sting, whatever they play that jumps mm. you is delayed. It's head first, then sting. Whereas a lot of movies will go sting and head at the same time. So you jump. So you, you, you all get it at once. And he was like, what happens with that? Why that's so terrifying and you can never really prepare is mm -hmm. because you see the image first, you react, and then there's a sound on top of it. So it's like a bang, bang, like... Because so you've been trained. You've been trained by every jump scare you've ever seen to expect a certain thing and yeah. you can't undo that training. And exactly. so that's interesting. I mean, I, I do, I remember that, that that was the scene in Jaws that Spielberg uh, went and reshot in... 
his swimming pool because he didn't believe he got it right the first time. And oh, no, right. I don't know if it was his swimming pool or uh, was it Werner Fields, his editor's swimming pool. But yeah, yeah, he watched it back um, with an audience and he was like, we can get a bigger reaction out of that. So they went yeah. off and they reshot um, the head popping out scene. So oh, no that's, why, that's why it's so good. Yeah. It's, it's funny that that's because uh, Jaws, I couldn't really watch Jaws. Uh, I, I found that I'm not a horror fan. You're not. All. Hate it. Can't stand were you, it. Were you ever a horror fan? Like when you were a kid? No, couldn't stand Never. it. Never. Uh-uh. So and wait, now I'm so, like, now I'm one of yeah. Flanagan's dudes. It's <laughs> right, you're thing, the, like... Flanagan's players. Yeah. Um, uh. So wait, you were going to say you watched Jaws and, uh, or you oh, didn't watch Jaws? I couldn't, that terrified me. I remember like a cousin showing it to me and it like, it screwed me up for a very long time. Yeah. I was like, nope, that intro. Mm -hmm. Nope. And, you know, I'm already scared of my own shadow, especially as a kid. I was so scared of everything. I was terrified. And um, and I guess I never really confronted it. I just let it be. So now, like, when I had to watch Hill House, because I've stayed away from that genre for so long because of just, like, awful experiences and being terrified, I've never right. kind of built the calluses. Are you about to tell me like your 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 introduction to horror was Hill House? Because I watch a shit ton of horror, and Hill House is fucking terrifying. So that is that is possibly it's that Hill House gets under your skin because Mike yeah. Mike Flanagan has this this wonderful gift, and it's a it's a trope that you see a lot in horror, uh, but you don't often see it done as well as he does it, which is where you're just a little bit unsure of if you've seen something in the back of shop, and sure. it, yeah, it, it's yeah. it's that that creeps me out. So what was so what happened then? You watched Hill House and how 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 were you? It was fucking terrifying. Like, <laughs> I there was it, it it became a problem for the job. Like I can do I love thrillers. I love true crime. Like when I when I was uh, researching Ravi for I Zombie, dude, I went crazy. I was looking. I was watching real autopsies, and okay. I was seeing case files and watching like people video like exhuming coffins and seeing decomposed bodies at different stages and then i went to a real morgue I, warner brothers had arranged it, it, it when i had asked uh so a couple of us decided to like took them up on their offer and we went to a real morgue and we spent three hours there and you know i looked at real bodies and smell them and see i was a few feet away I, I imagine that is something you have to ask for i don't think warner brothers i think they might get into trouble if they go no you're all going CW to a morgue shows, <laughs> all cw shows send you to a morgue if you're doing riverdale <laughs> or the flash they, 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 that's part of their, their instruction <laughs> package. but um but yeah no i i, I wanted to do it because it was you don't get access to that you know there are so many things that you can um you don't need to research everything. Like if you if you're a killer, yeah, chill. You don't need to. You know that there is an element of acting mm. and and. Uh, but 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 again, like you can understand. You know, I, I'm surprised. You know, Robert De Niro learned. You know, got a taxi driver's license and drove around in a cab for x amount of days. Who knows what that did? Could he have not done it and just maybe drove himself around New York? Who knows, right? It's up to the individual, but. A morgue is so terrifying, and I think there's so much um, conjecture and fear that we have associated with that place and 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 with autopsy. Um, and that in our show, the kitchen of the Bly House is the morgue in iZombie. That's where a lot of the comedy comes from. That's the safe place of the show. So spending three hours looking at a real one, by the time we went into our prop one, we were so comfortable. We were so I was gonna just say, chilling. Like, that must be it, because he's so flippant about working mm -hmm. in a morgue right from the off in iZombie. I mean, I, I know that. I, I feel like I'm faking a bit here because I hadn't watched it until um, I knew we were talking. So mm. I binged it. Absolutely love it. I love a, pl a police procedural with a twist. Um, oh, yeah. And uh, yeah, I'm about halfway through season one in about two days. So oh, nice. It's great I mean, fun. It's really it's, good yeah, fun. It's fun. Yeah. It's fun. It's like, do you remember um, <clears throat> what was the Nathan Fillion one where he was the crime writer who joined the police? Castle. Or... Castle yeah. 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 Castle. Yeah. It's a bit, I, I love something like that. I think it's, it's, it's really easy to just like lose yourself to it for six hours at a time. Yeah. I mean, firstly, 
if I got upset with with people who hadn't seen iZombie, I'd I'd walk around very upset <laughs> all the time. Like, no one fucking watched that show. Hey, um, I, listen, I was just trying to be transparent. I didn't want to. No, I appreciate going, that. No, no, no. I didn't I want totally... you to walk away going, "Wow, I, I, Alex, Alex loves Zane is a yeah. big iZombie fan." Let's send him some merch. No, I, I mean, I knew we knew that. Like, <clears throat> uh, there was it was very obvious to us at the time that you know numbers wise, I think we did really well with our first couple of seasons, but they dwindled. Um, it was a it was a, a very niche kind of cult following, and it's grown a bit more. It's starting to have that, and and I think Rob predicted that. I mean, I don't know if it was Bly or or some of the projects that some of my co stars have done, but I, I'm seeing this influx of people, and and the pandemic probably helped, but uh, it's definitely found new fans. But um, and it must have been a game changer for for you in terms of your career. Like, can you do you think like the kind of roles because you kind of it, like after i zombie it was bly uh for yeah. you and uh, Same so year, yeah. so do you do you think i zombie changed things for you oh dude i zombie saved my life um i so i went to drama school but i went to an amateur drama school um shout out to the questers theater in ealing um but that's that's where like i i saw star wars as a kid i was like I want to be in Star Wars. What the fuck do I do? <laughs> and that's it, right? And I was I was eleven or twelve, and I it just became my obsession. And um, I didn't know you like Star Wars. You like <laughs> I, a tiny bit. Just that I'm like it's you know it's on my IMDb trivia. Um, but uh, but yeah, like I didn't know how or what where my role would be in Star Wars. I just knew that I needed to be a part of it. And initially, it was going to be um, special effects. So. I got into production and so I was going to like um, this college that was terrible that said they did this media production course and within about three weeks I lost faith in them and I was like oh fuck this is awful um, but I was making short film for the for the for the assignments and in that I ended up being in one of my short films and I was like oh well you're better at this and you have more fun with this so I dropped out of that Join that theater school. Mm. Uh, so I got out at, I was 20, 20, 20 years old, 21 years old, and then nothing until I zombie. And in that period, I was auditioning a lot uh, in London um, and those same fucking sterile rooms. Just, and it was like three, four times a week. Uh, if it was a commercial, I was DiCaprio. I think other people were afraid of me. So I was like the Enviraphone dude and Champions League and Subway <laughs> and PlayStation and fucking, well, I don't know, Rubicon Mango Juice. Here um, he comes. We might as well leave. Yeah, exactly. now, I don't know it, what that was about. I was on fire <laughs> when it came to that. Give me, you know, uh, a BBC drama, nothing. And so it took me uh, until I was about 26. It took me about five years of solidly auditioning um to get a line and even then i think it was cut it was on a channel four drama and it was cut and then eventually i got holby city hmm. and i was like i'm fucking speaking on camera <laughs> uh, and that was like a big celebration and then it was eastenders again like three lines i was the manager of the chicken shop and i fired shirley um that was my career and I, you know now i'm 27 and it's it's like me doing <laughs> You, yeah. Like you're not. This isn't the, the 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 game changer you thought it would be. And I got very close to quitting, man. I was super like I was disenfranchised and felt that I don't want to do this for another few years. Um, I'm gonna die. Like I cannot afford to do any. This is killing me, and it's killing my future. Um, and I, I remember having a conversation with my then agent after a really bad audition where I think I was I was just treated extra mean that day i was i was already part of the cattle call but that one felt like even even more Treated kind of gross mean like as in just not given the time of day or actually spoken to like badly both. both it was it was a bit of both and it's super common man like one day i'm going to play one of these guys that you know has a budget for some fucking crappy bbc show and thinks that they're <laughs> James Cameron. Mm. 
and they're so dismissive and just so ugh. and they feel like the it's minute weird. you walk in you feel like yeah. they, they you they already have the attitude of you've wasted my time mm-hmm. and we haven't even done the scene yet that's the energy of the room isn't it isn't it weird like i I've met people like that in the industry, like mm. who who somehow feel that they have to pl- that, like their small bit the small bit of power they've been granted allows them to live out this fantasy of of being this big shot, like mm. and, and acting like you know like they've got three Oscars in a cabinet at home, and you you, you just sort of go, well, just why? It's always yeah. puzzled me. You sort of end up just going. By why? What? What is the point? Who is gaining from this? Like, I mean, what? What? How fragile is your ego? And why? Why do you feel the need to just like be that person? I've never understood it. It's. It's usually. I mean, you nailed it, man. It's because they haven't got three Oscars, and the little bit of power, kind of. It's so. Even I've met badly behaved actors, and they're usually the ones who aren't really doing shit. And yeah, you're like, they'll come in on yeah. your show as a guest and you're like, yo, why the fuck are you talking to our crew like that? <laughs> like, and then you'll get giants. Like you'll meet giants and mm. Carla Gugino, for instance, mm. right? It's yeah. Carla Gugino. Uh, uh, like I saw her and I was like, uh, Sin City, Watchmen. Like, and also she was one of my first crushes from the Bon Jovi video. <laughs> she is the nicest human in the world. There's a reason why she works so often. There's a reason why she's in Gunpowder Milkshake and stuff. Like, and she still continues to to work with with the biggest and the best. It's because she's fucking great and she's great to work with. She doesn't have, like. There's nothing. Then you meet someone who you know has been a guest on a few things. Maybe had a bit of this, or maybe a few years ago was in a procedural asshole. Yeah, and you're like, huh. It's because they don't have that success. So it's like they use this as a way of this little power to kind of bully a set around or, mm. or puff their chest out. I think, uh, yeah, I think it's, uh, it's, there's also that thing where I, I think sometimes, I don't know whether it's them or their PRs or someone's got it wrong somewhere down the line and they think to make themselves seem like a big star mm. or bigger than potentially they are, they have to act like a diva. Uh, you know, I've encountered it and it's, uh, yeah, you're right. You sort of, unfortunately, you do catalog that. And it's very, you know, you meet people so sporadically that you end up going, well, that is what I think of them. Yeah, until I, and uh, even when I meet them again. But, but the, uh, go on. Oh, sorry. You know, I was just saying the energy that those, those, those people would give off for like the crappiest commercial, just like, <laughs> you know, it, 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 it got to me. And then like, it was a Friday and I called, I, remember I called my agent. I was like, I don't want to fucking do this anymore. I was like close to tears. It's just you, that's how you spend your week, mm. and and um, and they they said to me, uh, "All right, cool. Um, <laughs> we have an audition for you." <laughs> yeah. Just, All right, mate. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's so I, you know, it must be a weird thing because you have this relationship with an agent, and you know, you do sort of want a little bit of a a bit of a hug, uh, like yeah. a, 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 you're gonna, a little... you, they know you're coming back on Monday. <laughs> Yeah. They know you're in it now. This is X Factor. They know this is your dreams, and you know, like they just want. I just want to vent, and them. To, I want them to beg me to stay on yeah. their books. That's you all. just you just want to live through like a, a little montage moment with maybe Sigur Ross playing in the background, and just yeah, like exactly, yeah. So that that conversation ended up just them going, uh, "We got a pilot for you called I Zombie uh, for Monday morning," uh, and I was like, "Okay, sounds terrible." the fuck's an eye zombie <laughs> and then um crammed that weekend just out of pure frustration and then on the monday i went in and read for it and i remember the cast director sat back and was like how long have you been acting and, and i was like i don't know i think eight years nine years now and she was like how come you've never where where have you been and i was like i knew it yeah, where have I been? Why why is it taking me this long to get like a speak? I can act. I like I'm I'm okay at what I do, you know, I'm not great, but you know, I'm I'm learning. And dude, within a week they had cast me as one of the leads. Uh wow. Rob Thomas saw the tape and just was like it bypassed all um screen tests, network tests, network approval. Um I was just flown in. Did you that I mean that's amazing. Did you think after you did the audition? Did you go, yeah, I think I nailed that before yeah. she said, uh, that, so you knew there and then. I remember you were like, knowing that the, the, I remember knowing that 
I had a, an interesting take on it that was like, I felt good about it. It felt, mm. it felt good to just do the scene at home. So I knew that I was, I was actually looking forward to performing it, which is, you know, a good bit of advice for people. Like, yeah, I was excited. I was like, I can't wait for people to see this. I think I've put some work in. And I, I remember the, the brief for the character said highly caffeinated. Uh, Scotty from Star Trek, highly caffeinated. And I, um, this kind of this this weird twist of fate what happened so i would i knew how to do this scene at a million miles per minute uh sticking to the brief right and then as i got closer and closer on the tube outside i was having a quick smoke before i went in i start thinking ah, you know what it's a bit much right that's a bit too broad it's a bit too cartoonish i'm a, i'm gonna bring it back i'm gonna bring it back i don't want to twist tw trip up on my words um and then where I sat in the waiting room, I could see the assistant, Carson Director's assistant's um, iMac. And she was cutting together other auditions. So I could see all the dudes who had been in before me for Ravi on the screen. Because I just, where I happened to be sitting, I could see a screen. And I didn't feel like any of them were moving. Because even though I didn't have sound, I could tell from their energy. I was like, oh, none of them are highly caffeinated. None of them did the did the thing that it says in bold on the Carson thing. Mm. So that empowered me to go, no, fuck it. Do what you said you'd do. Do it. I go in there and just, it's big. And I'm like, da -da 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 -da. And, I, and then within, yeah, like I said, within a week. So I just stuck to it. I stuck to my instincts. I followed the brief and it changed my life. It saved my life, man. And, and yeah, as soon as it ended, uh, Bly Manor came along. Um, and going right back to what you said, I had to research it. Um, by watching Hill House, and I was very upset by all of it. I was, I my first meeting with Mike, it literally went like this. Dude. It was, this is, this is like, he's such a fucking nice, he doesn't deserve the crap that I am when I talk. So, like, I walk into his room and meet Mike Flanagan, and I was like, uh, yeah, I've got a bit of a bone to pick with you, man. The fucking jump scare in the car. Like, what's your fucking problem? <laughs> like, I said, I was so scared I didn't jump scare. You know those ones? I didn't do this. I just was like, yeah, because inside all sorts of shit just went on. Um, and I, so I was, at, and then the next question was, you know, we have the scripts, and these, and the next question was, what's you and McGregor like? Because I knew he'd just done Doctor Sleep, and he was like, yeah, he's cool, you know. And, and I was just trying to get him to talk about Star Wars, and that was our blind meeting. Oh, yeah. Uh, so you did, you did watch Doctor Sleep. He arranged a screening, right? Because um, because that's coming pretty, out. That's, it's pretty scary in parts. It's certainly nasty. Oh yeah, it was, and I had to watch The Shining to know what was going on in Doctor. That Sleep. was going to be my next question. So you have now watched The Shining. Yeah. Was this the first watch of The Shining? Yes. For you, and are you ready? Yeah. Overrated. <laughs> and oh, I know. I see the typewriter. I see it. Uh, What's, uh, uh, what? I've got what? a tiny, there's a tiny thing that I... Raul Coley, it's on. been a pleasure speaking to you. Thank it. you yeah. for your time. <laughs> Go on then. Now let's hear it. I'm interested. Tell me. Look, I think it's, I do think it's really good. I mm. do. My issue was um, Jack looks like he's going to rip his family's face off before he's even got to the Outlook Hotel. Mm -hmm. Like he's coming in hot. <laughs> right. At his interview, he's already like, you know, and... Uh. and I don't know. I just want to, like, who am I to just talk about Nicholson and Kubrick? No, it's, but I would have liked a little bit more of a, you know, a bit of an arc. You know, who has exactly the same opinion as you, Stephen, uh, Mr. King. Stephen King. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. He's, uh, that's, I'm that just was defending my boy. <laughs> that was his, uh, that was his massive problem with it. He was like, you know, at no point do you think that this is a normal, nice guy who's being infected by the evil in the hotel. It's, yeah. uh, yeah. And, and I think that's but, more interesting to watch, you know, yeah. but. But have you, uh, wait, so you do like, you've, have you watched, do you watch much Stephen King? Do you read Stephen King? You like Stephen King? Uh, this gets me in trouble. Um, I'm currently, it's, it's at this point, it's offensive that someone I now collaborate with a lot. And, you know, Stephen King is Mike's hero. Mm. We can't talk, you know, like, might don't want to talk about George Lucas all the time. When he's sick, you know, he wants to talk about Stephen King. 
right. um, and I can't. So I've never read King. I'm currently reading King as we speak. Uh, I'm oh. doing like a huge research on the man and and all his works, mm. um, and his movies, and so I'm I'm going through it now. It's yeah, I'm having to do all of this horror shit now as an as an adult because of this relationship. I think it's good for you. I think it's really good. I think this is important yeah. stuff. I mean, look, you got Pennywise over here. Like you I need saw to it, do... I thought oh, it was great. You the new one or the, the Tim new one, Curry? Not the Tim Curry one, no. I haven't seen the Tim Curry one. Watch the Tim Curry one. It's, uh, yeah, it's, it's, that's the film. To talk about a film that screwed me up as a kid, yeah. that was, it was, uh, Tim Curry as Pennywise in, in the TV movie of it. It's, um, it's absolutely terrifying. Is it probably, holds up? it's very difficult to disassociate my memories of watching it as a kid. I did do it again recently and it's not as scary, but as a kid, oh, it was, yeah, uh, I remember that being the one. We, we are similar in age and like that yeah. was what candy man was another one I, I these are the movies i stayed away from i was like new no. weird isn't it you see that's uh the, just the power that horror has especially i mean I, obviously it still holds power now but something like candy man little gimmicks like saying his name five times into a mirror and you just yeah. wouldn't do it you'd be standing with friends and the power of that movie would not yeah. allow any of you to ever do it five times yeah it's it's especially amongst kids like the way it ripples through school, a title, and like it's enough for people to just like kids to just I mean, even be afraid of just the, someone telling you the synopsis, and it's just like nope. Mm. I mean, the funny thing is, I'm a massive fan of video games, and and I am a big film fan, but where where missing out an entire genre in film seems criminal, right? Like, yeah, how can you? There's so and you know, I've still seen Twenty Eight Days. Like, I'm not that bad. Like, I do get out and watch stuff it's just not it's not it's not my choice but i will go out and see the best stuff i saw hereditary because how could i not right like mm. it's got to be done so i do do it it's part of my industry now with games something about even though it's a horror i cannot i have to play it even if i hate every second of it because games so important to me i feel like i cannot ignore an entire genre mm. so yeah i play that. I, I, yeah. I mean, like you look down, um, you look down your CV, and it's uh, there's obviously there's Bly, mm. there's I Zombie, uh, Doctor Crane in Harley Quinn, mm -hmm. aka the Scarecrow, uh, Gears Five. I mean, this is like sci-fi comic book, yeah. like sci-fi horror. Uh, this is this is this is a very cool CV to have. I mean, it's like really cool genre stuff that, that you're getting to do. You are tapping into something that I've only admitted to a few people recently. And you just, you've, you, you are echoing my sentiments, which is I never planned any of that, right? I didn't intend to be in Harley Quinn and Supergirl and Gears of War. And um, even, you know, Bly Manor is still an adaptation of the, the, the novellas. And so there, there's always this, it's genre stuff, right? Mm. And and sci-fi. And what's happened is, and it's all my shit. Like I love all of it. Um, you look, I look back at it, and I'm like, why would I want to do this role? It's not in that bracket anymore. <laughs> so it's starting to like, I'm starting to become protective. Where I'm like, yeah, that doesn't fit with the CV, which is fucked because it's gonna, it's holding me back because I'm turning down shit, and you know, because I'm in my back of my mind, I'm like, yeah, but. Is it sci-fi though? Yeah, but is it a video game reboot? But I also don't want to be that guy because, you know, I, there are so many wonderful things out there. But yeah, like right now when I read scripts and when I, when I go up for auditions, I am looking at the, I'm like, does this fit in with the CV? Um, uh, but yeah, no, it's, it's been, it's been a, a, a happy accident, all of them. Um, I don't seem to book stuff that's not around that. And I seem to book the ones that are, so... And now the I new mean, one is Zack Snyder's um, project that I just did this year, uh, which is uh, Twilight of the Gods, which blew my mind. How was it? It was, it was amazing. Uh, I wasn't expecting that to happen this year, like to be directed by, by Zack Snyder. And um, we announced it uh, a few weeks ago. So I don't, think, I don't know how much press it got, but... Um, the cast, if you pull it up, is just, it's ridiculous. Um, 
but yeah that was that was an amazing experience again just came out of nowhere and uh fit right in with the cv um it's like a norse animation for netflix but zach's take on it Oh, yeah, that's that cool. cool yeah. He's a, he, did, did you meet him as part of uh, doing it then, Zach mm-hmm. himself? Yeah, yeah, yeah nice yeah. guy, isn't he? Dude, he's the uh, nicest. Um, I had uh, I was the third zombie from the front in his Dawn of the Dead remake, uh, who chased Ving Rames out of the shopping mall. So that's Seriously? how I'm, yeah, the 2004 reboot. Yeah, I get I get into trouble. I tell that story far too often, but it's my little <laughs> bit of uh, it's my little bit of uh, Zack Snyder connection there. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, and I, I didn't get told off. That's a great film off. as well. Oh, it's, a, it's probably one of the best reboots in history. Yeah, it's yeah. fantastic. But um, I gave my zombie a limp, and after the first take, he went, <laughs> he went, yeah, um, what are you doing? And I was like, I thought I'd give him a limp. He was like, yeah, don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> that was me being directed by Zack Snyder. Me being oh, that was the same. That was, we had the same experience. <laughs> yeah, um, don't do that. <laughs> uh, but Gears 5, um, I haven't played it. Gears 2. Hmm is um i mean i you, i know you're you're a massive gamer i sort of i have like i have spurts where i, I do a lot of gaming and then spurts where i just don't have the fucking time to yeah. do it but gears 2 was one of the few games that i ever completed um and that's just to go back to the the idea of gaming and horror and like all these different sort of like melding of um of genres mm. the moment in gears 2 where he thinks he's found his wife alive and she falls out and it cuts and it's a fucking corpse broke yeah. my heart. It's heart that, That's the moment I realized gaming can tell a story as well as a film. And like we'd crossed the threshold. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I had the same experience with probably a little later, but with uh, Telltale's Walking Dead, um, which was a choose your own adventure. You know, you pick your own dialogue options and stuff. So it does play a little bit closer to, to and it's come, it, it, it comes as episodes so it's a it's a closer bridge there is a scene in there um was the first time um i was um, crying crying Mm -hmm. while playing a video game holding a controller and 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 losing it and um now i i mean i try and bring others into the fold too because you sit around a group of actors and you know want to talk about Chekhov and shit and and I, i i feel like i've got to talk about I try and bring the conversations into video games in terms of a storytelling medium. Um, I also have to give like, <laughs> I've been doing this since drama school. They'll be like, yes, well, you know, the crucible and I'll go, yeah, but Rocky four, bruv. <laughs> like, <laughs> let's talk about Rocky four. So that's the kind of stuff I'm trying to pull into the, into the acting world. Let's talk about Rocky four and whether the robot's still going to be in it. That's the big not, question. Is that, is it, have they is he taken it out? Apparently, the director's cut has gone. I fucking love the, the sexy robot. robot. It got sexy because it <laughs> fell in love with Polly. Yeah. Like, what a great... Yeah, he changed its voice to a woman. And, yeah. Yeah. And uh... it got jealous and shit. <laughs> it's very strange. But that's part of the charm. That's what, like, Rocky Four is... I, I try and say this to anyone who wants to get in. Like, when you talk about film, and, you know, obviously, I mean, a ton of people who are so well-versed in, in movies... Uh, who haven't watched Rocky because you write those you some people write stuff off right and and I'm like yo Rockies are incredible for any student because each one echoes the time and the decade in which it's made you can watch this kind of arc of this one character's journey and from its gritty 70s start which you know almost mirrors what was going on at the time with your you know so, I don't know, Godfather, the type, you know what I mean? It, it came yeah. from that era into like 1980s Rocky 3 with Clubber Lang into the music video that's Rocky 4 into the 90s. And then you yeah. get the reboot of Rocky Balboa, which again was in that time of where we were going back and getting these old franchises back mm-hmm. up. It's such a wonderful way to, to watch cinema change. And, um, and then Creed, like, yeah, I, I recommend people anyone to, to watch that for a little history lesson so the big movie for you though as a kid star wars so I'm, I'm guessing i mean yeah i almost feel you must have been asked this a billion times mm. and that is your flat looks absolutely <laughs> sick in la it's only a little bit there's a giant seven thousand piece millennium falcon over there and yeah i'm i'm a little bit of a fan for sure 
It's it's very cool. So you, it's weird because I'm, I'm I don't know why, but I didn't. I thought you were working in LA, and then I, I I pieced it all together. And you live in LA, like that is home for you now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, I'm 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 not a resident. I, I can't, I'm not allowed to vote or anything. But I I'm on a work visa, so I've been here now, on and off. I mean, I, I predominantly, funnily enough, because of the way filming's worked, I've been in Vancouver more than LA. So I have this apartment, I live here. Um, but almost every year for the about seven, eight months, I've been gone in Vancouver shooting mm -hmm. either five years of iZombie. Then I did Bly Manor. Then I did Midnight Mass. I just got back from unannounced project. So Vancouver's this unofficial home. But yeah, when I, this is where I would put my bags down and, and, and chill. Uh, you like it then? I'm, I, I, I'm I assuming you do. No, I hated it. I, I fucking hated LA. Um, I, I, I first sort of came out here 2015, I think. And London's the only place I'd ever been. I grew up there. I'm from Wembley and um, you know the rules. And I don't know, like I came out here and it just didn't click for me. I was like, don't like it. Don't care for it. Don't care for the people. Place is dirty. It's, it, you know, I don't know. It just, it didn't gel. And it took about four years mm. and I just wouldn't come here. I, I preferred Vancouver. And then somewhere like on the fourth or fifth year it clicked. And I heard that's quite common for LA like, yeah. for people moving that like, it clicks and you go, Oh, this place is dope. And that was it. Like once it clicked, it clicked. And now, you know, anytime I'm asked to film and it's not in LA, I'm like, Oh, cause I, I love being here and, now I'm used to the sun and yeah. And have you found an area that you like? Cause I, it, it's a similar story for me. Like I, um, I, I was, I mean, it's weird. Cause I, I, I wasn't driving there cause I was going there for work and, yeah. um, this is back in 2003 before Uber. And so like you, it was fine getting a cab from a hotel to somewhere yeah. Yeah. and then getting back to the hotel was a no, nightmare. There were like three cabs in LA at any one time. Yeah. And so Uber changed it a lot uh, for me. But also, you used to do, you'd come up here for the Oscars, right? Yeah, we did the Oscars. You yeah, we've the done Oscars the Oscars in LA. Yeah. But yeah, it was uh, yeah, it was way back, and uh, yeah, two thousand three was the first trip to LA for Too Fast, Too Furious. Um, <laughs> but it was uh, it's I like I found Silver Lake, and that kind of changed yeah. a lot for me. I thought here's a little area which is an actual center, like you can mm -hmm. walk to a coffee mm -hmm. house and a restaurant, and everything's in walking distance, which for LA is kind of nuts because normally yeah. it's a forty minute drive between places. Yeah, it's Silver Lake comes up a lot. There are a few little pockets um, that it is like that. Like yeah, you can walk somewhere. Um, a block in LA is not a block in New York. <laughs> like it's, it's ridiculous. It's, it's so misleading. I, that's what happened, man. When I first got to LA, it was, I just wrapped season one of iZombie. It hadn't come out. Um, I had just got paid. I'd never had that before. So I was 28 and I went fucking mental. Um, <laughs> Till 2 a.m. though, because uh, everything shut at 2 a.m. Everything shut down at 2, 2 a.m., <laughs> absolutely. Actually, no, I found some places. I, I was on one, like such a fucking cliche of like working class kid from, you know, Wembley. And then, of course, I, I went crazy the way you'd think someone who had got their first paycheck <laughs> and a little bit of TV went. So, and I lived on Hollywood Boulevard. And I'm already oh. a bit of a psycho. I like I was I was a bit unstable in like Wembley. <laughs> so I was living on Hollywood Boulevard, driving around in a Mustang. Oh so it had to be a Mustang, right? Because you know we're cliche, we're British boys, you gotta get the American muscle car or rent or whatever. So I was living on Hollywood Boulevard, literally outside the Pantages Theatre. So even getting a coffee in the morning was like Disneyland, like there are tourists taking photos in front of you of the, of the Star Walk, right? And like people every day was like, hey, Star Tours, da, 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 da. So I was in that, the thick of that. And then I did it three years consecutively. 
And oh my even my God. co-stars, yeah, they were like, what is wrong with And I had a street level apartment. They were like, what is wrong with you? Hollywood Boulevard is, is like is is nuts in the way you described it, but also fucking scary. Like you walk oh. down the wrong end of Hollywood Boulevard and you're like, how is this called Hollywood Boulevard? Like then you need to like put a sign up going, you yeah. are now entering the fucking terrifying end of Hollywood Boulevard with scary people. Uh, Dude, I never took them seriously. To I didn't take American seriously. Look. They make the new like mass shootings, yeah. But I don't, I don't go to school, you know. Mm. I, I don't go to malls that often. So like, I didn't. Apart from like the gun thing, and then I knew, as long as I'm on the coasts, I'm cool. That was my perception of the UK. Oh, sorry, of, of the US from the UK. So I never took them that seriously. They were just like loud McDonald's, you know, excitable Disneyland lovers. That was what <laughs> I thought. And then I'm from nah, but I'm from London, bro. Like, do you know what I mean? I grew up in fucking like bad areas and 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 had you know unsavory friends and shit like that. So I was like, fuck, I don't care. And then I I decided to to walk one block. I lived near a Seven Eleven at two in the morning, and as I was walking, a car went by with. If you were casting like L.A. gangsters, you'd pick these three dudes. And one guy was hanging out of his passenger seat and he just was like, the fuck you looking at? And, and Alex, like, I have never shat my, like, then it all clicked. I was like, they have guns. This happens all the time. This isn't like a street stabbing in London. And it changed every, cause I used to start on them a bit. Like when we got oh. for a drink, I still had that pub energy, right? Like, uh, yo, yeah. get fuck out of my face. Mm. And, and then I, I realized in LA, I was like, no, 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 no. All of that British stuff, forget about it. Um, now I keep my eyes down. I moved from, from Hollywood Boulevard. I was like, I can't take this. I can't, I, going out for a pack of cigarettes could end up terribly. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, you know, um, yeah, that was just chaos. It was where my head was at. Now I'm in a very quiet area. I'm on the east side. So near Silver Lake and all of that. Okay. I found, yeah, not Silver Lake, but... Um, but yeah, I've been here for a couple of years now and it's it's gorgeous. I get it. I'm I'm in. So a Mustang though. Really? Yeah. That's still kind of, I mean, that's cool. I, I I won't lie, that's cool. That's cool. I'd have gone for, and it's my dream. If I ever moved to LA or America in general, it's the Pontiac Fiber Trans Am 1977 from Smokey and the Bandit. I was gonna say, what film is that from? That's Smokey and the Bandit, man. That's that's the car I drive. I like I, I looked for a while at getting one here, and then I realized how fucking wide it is. And like Oh I yeah, just, you'll never be able to drive it around. I couldn't drive it anywhere. Like I, you know, I live in North London. I'd be like, just like it would it wouldn't happen. I'd be stuck. I, I wanted the car from Bullet, the fastback. Oh that's yeah, my, that's my yeah. my dream. But you no, know, for now it's just um, <clears throat> it's just the Mustang. But most of my co-stars or people I work with or whatever are all Tesla junkies now. That's the other thing, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, LA's it's like that. So you got you got your Teslas. Although I will say this: like LA um, is leagues leagues above London in terms of vegan restaurants. And, oh like, yeah. It's it's crazy. Like uh, Crossroads on Melrose, you know the one that's owned by Travis Barker from Blink One Eight Two. It's yeah. like it's just the greatest restaurant. And then like near up sort of your way, there's a Little Pine, Moby's restaurant. That's amazing. I um, guess you yeah. yourself a vegan, right? As close as I can be. Close I, as you I, can. Yeah, I'm not really vegan, <clears throat> like because I eat cheese because I can't live without cheese and vegan cheese sucks. Sure. Yeah, but, uh, but yeah, some great vegan restaurants in LA. The the you? bashing you, you're, you're we, not. No, 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 no. Yeah. Um, the I said it like like it's a pop. No, <laughs> <laughs> no. Uh, nah, I still, uh, you know, I'm still eating McDonald's, isn't it? We'll figure that. I'll figure that out first before I leave meat. But um, right, I, I one of the bashings that UK would take, particularly London from from the US, was oh, I I, I stayed in the UK. Food's terrible. You get that so often when you meet Americans, they're just like, fucking food's awful. Food's awful. And I'd be like, what? London? How, what are you talking about? There's so much variety. And then I lived in LA and was like, oh. Yeah. Oh, yeah, you're right. I, they, they have fantastic food. But even uh, Vancouver shits on LA. Vancouver's food is just... Have you ever so, been to Vancouver? I, I have, yeah. Years and years ago, 2004, I was in Vancouver. Remember... 
did you ever see the Vin Diesel movie, The Chronicles of Riddick? Riddick, yeah. Yeah, yeah, the sequel to Pitch Black, so the second one. I was there covering that. I was you know how to it... say you had a limp, you were playing as... No, 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 they wouldn't <laughs> let me on that one. They wouldn't let me on that one. Because, um, you know, it's that weird thing, isn't it? Because Vancouver seems to be the place to be at the moment. Like, it mm-hmm. ebbs and flows from city to city, depending on, like, tax rebates and whatever That's the government right, yeah. of that country is offering and so forth. And there was a point where... in. Uh, the early noughties where Vancouver was the place and then it sort of went away again, but it sounds like it's back now. Oh yeah. The, I, I, cause like in the meantime, I know Atlanta's kind of become yeah. a bit of a, a bit of a, a, a spot, but uh, Vancouver, when I got there was, when we started, it was only 2014. And at that point they already had <clears throat> just the CW alone, which I don't know if anyone from the UK is listening. The CW is the network that, uh, a lot of the <coughs> I have this really weird smokers weeds. One second. <coughs> Excuse are me. you still um, are you still smoking? Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah. me too. Terrible yeah. habit. It's worse. Work makes it even worse. Like it's yeah. It's, it's associated to my job. Yeah. It's exact. I, I totally know what you mean. It's like yeah. if I have a if I someone goes yeah you got literally just it'll take us ten minutes to reset this light and I'm like cool I'm having a cigarette then yeah. that's where yeah. I'll be. Yeah. I've associated it to learning lines. Oh, which no! Might, so I'm going to be dead soon. <laughs> like, you give me a couple <laughs> more shows, I will be dead. Because it's it's like, okay, that's the rehearsal. Cool. That's what you want me to do. Right. G- give me five. <laughs> and it's a smoke with, you know, just running the actions through privately. But the cigarette has to be there. Um, but but um, what was I saying? Oh, the CW. Yeah. Like, by the time I'd got there, the CW had... 10 shows maybe it was like the flash and and supernatural um fucking hell riverdale there was so many anyway that it's become they called it um hollywood north i think it's nicknamed um and now i know netflix has or is doing a lot of productions up there um i i can't seem to get away from the place secretly i'm supposed to be going back again for um another big one but um yeah, I mean, I should have just bought a fucking place at this point. <laughs> I didn't know. But do you, uh, do you were going to say, do you like it? Is it nice, Vancouver? I mean, I, I, again, it was, what, nearly 20 years ago when I was there, yeah. and I thought, this is a beautiful city, really clean. And it's got, a, yeah. a, it's got the same climate. Does it have the same climate as LA? Is it like uh, London. pretty... London. All right, okay. Yeah, it, if you look at your weather app... Hmm it's pound for pound it's always the same it's the same kind of winters that aren't extreme like toronto they're just just the right side of cold like london is right Uh, tons of rain but then they could have a good summer um i sadly i mean look i i do love vancouver vancouver has some issues but for the most part um i don't think you can shoot in a better a, a better city um and it's so versatile the land like you can do it can double for New York in certain places. And at the same time, you can go skiing or go to the beach or do a forest thick, like mm. it, all within like a five, six mile radius. That's why you use Vancouver. It's, it's fantastic. The only issue is, is that most shows tend to move up to start filming around late August or mine have anyway. So I spend most of the time there in the autumn and winter. Uh, and then I don't leave until February, March. So I get, I see Vancouver at its like crappiest, gloomy, rainy, shitty. I don't want to go out. I don't care. Um, <clears throat> but this time, I think in eight years, this is the first time I just shot something and I hadn't been there during their June. And then I was like, fuck, this place is, imagine if this, like the, the weather changes that city. It just became, it's, it's a better LA. Um, yeah. So, that's the only issue is is most like I said most shows shoot in the winter and it fucking sucks. I'm tired but, of the rain. But do you do you miss London at all? I mean, like you've been out there for so long now. But I mean, obviously, I imagine you've got family here and yeah, yeah all my family. And do you, do you, do you get back much? Do you, is there something that London has that perhaps you're not getting out there? Yeah, just my loved ones. I, yeah. I, uh, we'll, we can get deep. I'm I'm like, it's it's a very it's a strange payoff, man. Um, those years I described to you where professionally I was miserable. Um, I, 
was amongst my friends, my, my loved ones. Like it was a phone call away. I was living at home with my folks, you know. Um, so socially, I was very comfortable, very happy. Professionally, I was miserable. And then the flip happened, which is I became professionally happy, uh, mm. socially miserable with LA, very isolated, mm. very cut off. And it's not for a lack of like, friends it's an attitude shift but there's something about la where no one really wants to fucking go 20 minutes down the road like you just don't it's just a very strange thing like everywhere see the other side of town is only what santa monica it's only 30 minutes it might as well be 30 days who no one wants to go that side of town so like i've definitely cut myself off a little bit from um that so it's just all work really and um I mean, the lockdown didn't help. I think th th that kind of really set me in my ways now where like before I'd go for a packet of cigarettes, right? Just down to the street, just to see people, I'd pop to the nearest 7-Eleven or whatever. Mm -hmm. And I'd only buy one packet at a time. So it was part of my daily routine. All right, wake up, let's get some cigarettes, let's go. And in the last six months, I started buying in bulks of 10. So I don't even have that because I'm just like, eh. I'll just sit here and watch a film or, or do some studying or whatever. And so, yeah, I've, I've flipped it. So I, yeah, I don't know what's happened. I'm, that I do miss. I miss, I miss, I just miss home really. I miss, I miss the people, but London offers me nothing career wise. The UK fucking hates me, man. Like you should see really? even now. Yeah, dude. Like even the way, like someone had to apologize to me because of the way a director spoke to me for an audition two years, like a year or two ago over a comment they made about iZombie. They were like, this isn't like that fucking American shit you've been doing. Like this is real comedy we do in the UK. And I was like, <laughs> they're still talking, like it still feels like I'm um, 26, wow. 27 at the commercial casting. And it's like, yeah, but you know, it's not like you're American junk. And so he apologized, the, the, the director apologized or some apologized casting apologized when they on had, their behalf. That was yeah. On their behalf. Um, cause I had flown in for a screen test to do that for quite a big project. And, um, and I only re I, I ended up dropping even my uh, uh, part in ways with my UK agent. Cause I can't book over at home. No one cares even now. Like, what do you it's, think? Do, have you analyzed? I mean, I tend, I, I ask because I tend to analyze the shit out of everything. Like, you know, yeah. like, I mean, long, long story from my end. Like, I, I changed my name from like, this is sort of, this is a, a real tangent, but I changed my name from my Arabic name when I was at school because yeah. I was absolutely petrified, like, of being like judged on that. So uh, I got rid of it. Um, yeah. Because I was, I figured like I didn't want to ever sort of walk away from something and go. I didn't get that because of my fucking name, yeah. and you know, it's a that's a big conversation for another no, day. No, no, I'm, but I'm I, with you. I yeah, just, yeah. I just wondered whether like you've sort of looked at it and wondered if there was a, a a reason for it. I think I felt at the time, um, and this may have changed. This is again, this is based on something almost ten years old now. I don't know how much it's changed, but. I felt like I was never really in with a shot. It was like, uh, it was fake. It was all already rigged. The best agents, the actors that were doing a lot of the UK stuff were already at the right schools. They already got nabbed by the best agents. They were being brought in for real auditions. Um, and it, and then there would be these cattle calls that would happen afterwards where they would just throw this little net out and just go, here, read for this. And then I'd, I'd read and it would go to the same people. And I'd go, oh, not to say that there was a lack of talent. I mean, the people I was losing out to for years was Riz and Dev and stuff like that. But then there was these other actors. Um, and you'd look and you'd go, oh, you went to that drama school. Oh, you went to Guild Hall. Oh, you went to Lambda. Oh, you went to Rada. Oh, you're with that agent. It was the same people constantly booking, and I was like, "Is that does that is that about quality, or is there more at work? Is there are they really just the best people for the job? Are they that well trained and, uh, that it's that, or is the game rigged? Is it? That's how I felt. I was like, mm -hmm. I don't have that kind of educational background. I don't have that level of agent. I'm still going for the same stuff because I belong to an ethnic group that is, you know, 
it's small. So, and then on top of that, this job at the time when I was doing it wasn't necessarily favored by my culture. You know, a lot of people are discouraged from going into the arts that are from um, certain ethnic backgrounds. Mm -hmm. So being from a small group meant that I'd always go up for everything, no matter how big it was, because they didn't have a choice. Um, But I would still lose it to the one or two people. So that's how I interpreted it. I interpret it as a members only club. Um, and the way I felt about America, which proved itself to me in my first real job was, Oh, we don't care if you're not a name. It's best. It's best person for the job. You could, that, the idea that like, you know, when you hear someone's like, I'm not even an actor. I, I went with my brother to the audition yeah. and they were like <laughs> you. And then that person becomes like a fucking a lister that, that idea or you're, you know, I was just at the grocery store and I got yeah. a modeling contract that's a real thing in america like it really is i genuinely believe that and i'm i myself feel like proof of that like when when my I zombie coast i was found out that they were like did you not do a network screening did you not we've we auditioned seven times before we got i zombie and i was like no one tape <laughs> and do you know what i mean walked onto set and then just that was it and that was the journey and so yeah i don't know if that kind of like started from the bottom that kind of thing that can happen um I don't know if that happens in the UK. I feel like there's a lot more ceilings for me anyway. And I don't know, even now. So I look. That, that's what I was going to say. But now, because obviously Bly, you know, Bly was huge here. Like, you know, platforms are now global. So it's not like, you know, whereas iZombie probably, you know, had. A, yeah, it didn't a, come a, to the UK for a while. Exactly. Whereas Bly, you know, everyone here saw it and it was, it was a big thing. It was a big talking point. So surely that has changed now, or do you still, it, it, it feels, it sounds a bit like you still feel like, you know, there, there is something different about the UK. I mean, uh, I'm not, it's, it's hard for me to say if it's changed now, like production, the industry has changed um, from, from, for a lot of people post covid like um there is less work there mm. there just is and a lot of projects are you know to to make a show right now or a film under covid guidelines adds about 20 percent to your budget like it's expensive it's expensive to have those daily tests for a crew so things are a bit slow anyway and that all kind of happened when bly came out so i haven't seen what how the industry would be without the with the training wheels off you know just going for it like it used to be so i can't speak to that but um i also don't i've been very fortunate that most now what's happening is i've I've started to experience the uh we want you which is i get the you know they contact my team and it's people offering me work it's like please would you read this script that doesn't happen in the uk uh but it's happening in the us so i'm not auditioning as much i'm not seeing it because now it's like this interesting project wants this or mike has got something fucking cool lined up um so i'm out in a weird way i'm sort of out of that for a little bit um but i yeah i don't know and i also look i'll put my hands up because i do look i I fucking miss Brits in general and I miss so much about home and like whenever I get to Heathrow airport, there's just this calm where I'm like, I know the rules here. I know these are my people. I feel less special because of course being a Brit, being an Englishman in, in LA it comes with attention that of course yeah. I want. <laughs> like, Hello. Hi. I'd like a latte. <laughs> you know, turn oh it up God, as well. Don't you? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. But, um, but yeah, like, I, I know that I, I'm almost like um, scorned. So I know that I'm like fuck you. Like if a you if a if a British production comes along and I, I have this weird attitude, which I need to adjust, man. I put my hands up. Um, if if anything comes up for the UK, I'm like, oh, now you want to fucking <laughs> hire me? Where were you when I was doing the Enviraphone commercial? So I've got this like attitude. <laughs> going in and i think i like there's definitely that going on and i've turned into this you know america been loyal so right. i'm gonna stay here because if it was up to you lot i'll probably still be doing harvey nichols commercials so yeah yeah ugh. yeah 
So I know there's an attitude adjustment. I know it's on me too. Yeah. I mean, that does sound, that sounds like you. I'm not going to lie. That sounds, that sounds like your it's thing. It's entirely but my shit. I yeah. understand where it, <laughs> where it's come from. But yeah, I, you know, if you're walking into a casting in the UK and go, all right, motherfuckers. So yeah. finally picked up the phone, did you? It's yeah, it's not a good look. Um, <laughs> I probably asked, I probably asked for it now, but like it's, it's yeah. And I, I, yeah, I've got, so I got this like weird look. I'm a very <clears throat> loyal, um, worker in the sense that like like with mike for instance now um i turned down some stuff i probably shouldn't have uh in stuff that is definitely fits in with the cv Mm -hmm. in fact probably you know is bigger than what i'm letting on i i turned down the, the, the golden egg, like the gold. I've turned down that stuff. That stuff has come along the big one. I mean, the um, only thing I know it's not that you turned down that I can't imagine you would ever turn down is a, a, is a part in the Mandalorian. So and that, that's the only thing I can, I can cross off the list of things that you won't have turned down. You're not, you're not right. But <laughs> I, it, no, it's the, it's the big stuff. Yeah. Right. I, I can't say because I'm still under. Yeah, of even course. My auditions are NDA'd um, with that stuff. But like, uh, I, I I was offered something that was the dream and uh, said no for Midnight Mass for a very silly reason. And because Mike was like, what the fuck are you doing? We'll make the schedule work. Why are you turning this down? And I was like, no, I agree to your project first. Wow. This is something that we want to commit to. This is something that I, I want to commit my time to and I don't want to share it. So mm. I know it was the big one. I know, I know it was the thing that I, I want, but um, no. And... That that was something I get I, I did not for Mike but I did for for Midnight Mass and and um, that's the kind of actor I want to be and, and and that seems to have paid off and so the same the same token of like where with Mike's concerned now I'm like I'm down yeah like he could just mention something that has a rough shoot date without a contract and if I get an offer for something that conflicts I'll say no. And I know my team were like, what the fuck? You don't even have the contract for the other thing. And I'm like, I, this is this is my guy. Like, I, I, you know, um, I'm the same towards the country. I'm the same, uh, the same towards LA. Like American productions are taking precedent right now. It shouldn't because my, 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 my manager is obsessed with, who's American, she's obsessed with uh, UK stuff. And she's like, we there's so many good uk shows what the fuck are we doing like are you sure don't we we want to be on this and i'm like eh um yeah but that's that's amazing that i mean like i guess for you like as well as your relationship with mike as a person you must feel that you're doing your best work and being being fulfilled in your career by the roles that you're doing for him so it's not just like look i really like this guy i like the atmosphere on set I guess it does. It does boil down to like the satisfaction you are getting from your job. Oh, I mean, yeah, he, yeah, he makes good stuff. Like, it's mm. not. It's it, yeah, I'm not just hitching my wagon to something who's just got constant work, no matter the quality. It's it's good stuff. It's great stuff. Midnight Mass, um, honestly, is one of the is the best thing I've ever read. Uh, I accepted immediately on just the story outline, the pitch he gave me in the room. I was like, this is incredible. Um, <laughs> it's going to be huge but um but the the reason why mike uh and trevor trevor macy is mike's producing yeah. partner um the reason why those two are, 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 they've got me for life is because the industry needs to see that you've done something before before they offer it it's that closed loop that you see with most a lot of professions you know um we won't like with an agent you can't get an agent without a job, but you can't get a job without an agent. It's this closed loop. Um, <clears throat> the same goes for for for, for acting roles. Um, you you're not going to get offered certain things outside of what you've already been offered. So when I played Ravi, all my stuff looked like versions of Ravi. And when I did Owen on Bly, all the auditions that came after that echoed Owen. Right. There were no things out of left field. And cool that's that's always going to happen um where mike and trevor are special for me is they don't give a fuck what you just did in the last show for them they don't care so it's you know i i i had dinner with with trevor while we were doing mass and he was like man i want to see you play a prick 
And I, and I was like, yeah. And he was like, yeah. And that's it. Like, they don't, it's not about what I've done before. It's, there's a trust that they're like, we're going to give you this and you're going to make it work, whether you've done it on camera before or not. And who yeah. gets to do that? So it's just this complete, they, they give you, and they do it with Henry Thomas. You know, Henry's fucking phenomenal. Um, for those of you who don't know, Henry was Elliot and E.T. and um, was Hill House and Bly and done a ton of stuff with, with Mike. But, but Henry has that relationship with them, which is, sounds so scary. He, they just go, we'll give you this British, we'll do this. And then Henry goes off and comes back and it's ready. Like he's, you know, Dr. Sleep. Mm -hmm. He didn't audition. He, like Mike doesn't know how he can play Jack. He, he just gives it to Henry. Henry goes away and comes back and there you go. And they're doing that with me, which is terrifying because I'm not even close to being that talented of an actor. But that's, the, that's the, 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 the relationship that we're having. And that's why I'm sticking with them for more than, obviously more than just that reason. But one of the, one of the best things is Mike's single-handedly giving me one of the most diverse showreels. Um, my stuff in Midnight Mass is, is, doesn't resemble Blight in the fucking slightest. So that means that I can expect offers or auditions based off Midnight Mass now that are completely different to Blight. You know what I mean? So I get this, right. this amazing demo reel that should broaden my, my, uh, my castings. So that's been a great thing. I mean, that sounds exciting. The whole thing about Midnight Mass sounds so exciting. I mean, I look, I, I think I can say the few things that I know because they're online, <laughs> which is that, you know, a small community on an isolated island is visited by a priest and shit happens. It's pretty yeah. much all there is out there. But weirdly, you, you see Mike Flanagan's name and you hear that and you go, he's directing every episode. He's yes. written it with a couple of co-writers as well. And I'm just like, oh, that's... I have a real love for um, series and especially horror that takes place on an isolated location. Like it transports you there and you as the audience feel trapped in the location like yeah. the people, like the cast themselves are. I don't know if, whether you saw the terror recently, the one about the John Franklin expedition, which goes wrong and gets caught in the ice and there's a monster. Man, that's really good as well. Um, but yeah, it just, on paper, Midnight Mass sounds great it's um yeah it, it's mike's i mean mike will say this <clears throat> uh he he thinks it's his best work he's ever done um and if you watch gerald's game mm. midnight mass is on the shelf above yes Hoss, and it's also in hush midnight mass is something that mike wrote 10 years ago um and it's taken this long for it to get uh, greenlit and um yeah it's his it's his special project it's the project um and um and it's re it's really fucking good like uh the cast again like this has been the strangest one i've been on this is what it must feel like to be on a marvel thing um our chairbacks for instance didn't even have our character names usually your character name is also with your chairback they knew that social media, someone might post it. So it's just yeah, our yeah. names and the name of the production. Uh, no details, character names. If you go on IMDb, you won't know who we're playing. You don't, you wouldn't even know who plays the priest. Mm -hmm. They've really locked this up in a way I've never seen before. Um, and yeah, apart from that synopsis, which is the only thing I can really riff about, um, they can say, yeah, I mean, Mike and um, Michael Fimignari, is his DP. Um, these two just, yeah, they, we tore it up for seven, six months. We shot seven eps out of sequence. So oh. it's like a feature. Yeah, we shot, what, basically three movies back to back almost. Um, the schedule, like trying to track where you were. Like, I know I did one of my last scenes on my first week and vice versa. Yeah. and they were six months apart um, <laughs> so it was but mike is he is one of the best like captains like you know your destination he the, the brief he gives you it's it's fucked working with mike it really is because it's you are, i always feel bad for the next person i do it's not fair there's a reason why everyone keeps coming back for mike it's because of him and 
you get notes like that and you get support like that um it's really hard to like not get spoiled and then and then you go back to another job and you go oh <laughs> oh yeah yeah i miss mike but yeah it was it was one of the most incredible experiences. i can't wait for people to see it i'm not I... even scared i'm going to drop spoilers because i know this is the first time my loved ones like do not know anything <laughs> I've never done that before. They usually know, even on set, I'm, I'm not that guarded. I'll be like, you know, covered in something or, you know, they'll see me on eyes on me and they're like, why have you got cuts all over your face? And I'm like, eh, Ravi gets fucking beaten up. Um, but on, on mass, I wouldn't call him in costume. <laughs> Didn't talk to him about anything. I was just like, told mom and dad and I was like, just wait. Won't even tell them the release date because <laughs> I'm that scared. Wow. I'm like, I'm not telling anyone anything. But it's, I mean, it's, you know, I think things like that pay dividends. I don't want to know anything about it. I, you know, I wouldn't even start to try and ask you for things, not because of any other reason that it's more exciting to watch something and not know about it, especially when you've seen the likes of Bly and Hill House and, and you know what he's capable of as, as, a, as a filmmaker. And, and also, he's he's earned the right to lock down a production and keep it all a secret because yeah. you know he's got a legacy now already. After yeah. you know such a uh, such a short time, you sort of go, yeah, it's a Mike Flanagan joint. Yeah, the fact that it's become a Mike Flanagan joint, like <laughs> it, the thing is, it's not a quick journey. Um, <clears throat> he, you know, he's been chipping away for yeah, yeah, like, that's donkeys, true. Donkeys, but yeah. then. Yeah, Hill House just kicked him into mm. the speed at which Hill House just kicked him into that level, and um, yeah, and like I'm I'm in his ear all the fucking time now because I'm like, why don't what, do you want to do like a Star Wars horror? <laughs> like no, <laughs> like like do you really? Is it like you just chew his ear off about Star Wars? Does he yeah. even like Star Wars? Is he a big Star Wars? I mean, who doesn't he's, like Star Wars? Yeah. No, he is. He is. You know why? Right. No, he's not. I don't know, Alex. <laughs> that's the point. The thing is, he could be just fucking humoring me. I don't know. Yeah, he likes it. Of course he does. Yeah. Right. But not like on a level that I do. But um, like, I think he's more Raiders. Mm. I know he's, I, like, Spielberg's a big deal to him and, and um, Jaws and E.T. and mm. Raiders of Lost Ark. I think that's his jam. He doesn't feel how I feel about George, I think, is how he feels about about steven spielberg but yeah i i was like oh, I'm, I'm in his ear like i don't know how the industry i'm still on one side right i'm still ignorant so i'm like why don't why don't we get the rights to bioshock you should direct the bioshock t like video game tv show it's it doesn't work like, like that it's one of the three games i've completed that's a fucking good game that's a yeah great it's game. a really fucking good game and like it, flanagan doing that doing bioshock that would be incredible with those little girls who you steal yeah. the, the energy from or yeah. something. I can't remember it's ages ago. Yeah. Little, uh, little sisters, I think, with big daddies and stuff. But That's but, right. Yeah. And uh, the Andrew Ryan, the Irish, uh, the, and the would you kindly. But yeah, like it, it's, that's, that's, uh, yeah, I'm always in the ear. Trying I, to... You should keep whispering that. Keep whispering that. That's a great. The Bioshock I, Mike Bioshock Flanagan. Bioshock Mike Flanagan thing. No, dude. Even if he just show ran it and got his, <laughs> his top horror directors. Um, but yeah, again, like I said, I don't, I, I'm very ignorant. I just think it's, it's like dad's got a credit card and I'm like, anything <laughs> I remotely scare, I'm like, oh, you should do Silent Hill. Do you want to make a video game? I'm like the worst agent for him. Like, no, I'm good. I've got projects now. Fuck off. Yeah. So look, I mean, I mentioned it a moment ago and then we got sidetracked onto something completely different, but you have got a lot of, kick-ass star wars mm. shit right behind mm. you there so when did it start what movie was it was it on tv did you go to the cinema where did it begin and why oh, see i love talking about it uh it started with the uh special edition so i never saw star wars growing up i was a big masters of the universe fan with dolph lundgren the Okay. That's that, where it started. So The Shining's overrated, but fucking give me a bit Under of Underrated <laughs> is the Mars universe, particularly the Frank Langella's performance and Bill Conti's score come at me. 
Um, yeah, no, you right. Hey, listen, Frank Langella is Skeletor is something to behold. Dude. He acts beyond that makeup and you're like, fucking hey, man. It's That's incredible. Weird. You'll yeah. never, no one will ever see. It's one of the best villain performances I've ever seen. Um, yeah, yeah, but yeah. no, yeah, I, I, Star Wars was not my jack, like Batman 89. I was a big Tim Burton fan as a kid. So it was Beetlejuice, yeah. Batman 89 and stuff like that. Yeah, quick, um, very quickly, Batman Returns is better than Batman though, correct? No. Yeah, so, no, no, sorry, that was a statement. Uh, no, Batman Returns. <laughs> Batman Returns is better than Batman, definitely. Uh, I Batman strong... Returns is the best Batman movie. Oh, wait, you mean including the including the Nolan trilogy? Yeah. The no, yeah, 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 yeah. Batman Returns is where it. it these it, are certainly it, takes. Um, they are takes. They are takes. There's so there's there's something about '89 that there's it's it's too attached to i can't be objective i think i think that's the issue like all jokes aside like when something's so important to you like it's i remember being four five years old when i saw batman 89 and the you know him driving into with kim basinger into the cave and the wall goes like all of that you can returns can't yeah. compare to it because i saw it as a five-year-old you know and you're just yeah so it's hard to be objective. And listen, I'm, and I'm not really asking you to. I mean, Batman, 1989 Batman is, is a phenomenal film. Uh, yeah. You know, it's got its issues. Jack Nicholson sure. um, taking top billing uh, over Batman, over Michael Keaton in a Batman movie is, will always be a little bit weird. But, um, but yeah, it's... it's, a, well, it's and he's also, movie. he does another Jack Torrance thing. I mean, he's the Joker before he's hit the acid. <laughs> <laughs> like he's already a psycho. He could have just taken the uh, taken on the Batman as Jack Napier, but no, you're right. There, there are issues with that film for, for sure. Yeah, I'm Jack Palance, we never saw Billy. Uh, uh, God, Billy D. Williams is Harvey Dent. We never got oh, to see. Which yeah, was that a shame because that, that yeah, would be interesting. Yeah. yeah, it made me scared of being. I never want to be killed in a dressing gown. When Jack Palance dies in a dressing gown, I always, I've always felt really uncomfortable about the idea. It's sort of embarrassing, like like someone finding a body and you're in slippers in a dressing yeah. gown. I remember. Is that the scene he opens with? Is that you, sugar? Is it sugar lumps? He calls Jack Nicholson. <laughs> yeah, like, something like that. What it's is me, it? yeah. sugar. Yeah. Um, but Star Wars didn't come along until the special editions and so it was on my radar and i think it was the doritos came with the discs mm. they had a star wars doritos thing and i used to fucking love doritos as a kid <laughs> it was in my christmas so i was getting these like freaking discs with like han solo on carbonite inside my um in my doritos anyway <coughs> the merch hit me the marketing worked and i think it was my 11th birthday um i had asked my dad for the Star Wars trilogy special editions. So that's the VHS box set. I got the gold one. And uh, I think my birthday was on a Friday or something around there. Anyway, we weren't allowed to, one of the house rules was no video games and no movies until Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. During the week, you're not allowed because they'd lose us and we wouldn't do our homework. So that was the reward. You get to Friday, you can watch Rocky or play your video games. Which is why even now, me and my sister go fucking mental on Fridays. Even though as an actor, every day's a, today's a Friday, you know that. Like, I'd have got fuck all to do. I could do what I want. <laughs> but in my head, when Friday comes along, I'm like, get my tits out. Let's go crazy. Because my parents have conditioned me to think all the best things happen on a Friday. Anyway, I yeah. came home from school and put a new hope in. And... and this is your first watch. This is the first, first time you've I seen did it, it alone. Man. Yeah, yeah. And I did it alone. I just did it in the living room. I was like, here's a new hope. And I was like 10 or 11. And just like heart palpitations during the battle of Yavin. And didn't know that Han was going to, you know, cause I, I didn't, there wasn't spoilers. It wasn't social yeah. media. So like when, you know, as the, <clears throat> as uh, Vader locks on and then, you know, Yahoo! <laughs> like as a 10 year old 11 year old i was just like fucking hell and um and then that night like again this isn't binging culture we're, we're talking about a different time i was like another one so i put empire in not knowing i knew that i'm your father that that you couldn't avoid that kind right. of spoiler so you did know that okay, okay i did okay. know that but the way like i didn't know about han just being put in carbonite and Mm. it just leaves it there <laughs> like we lost shit went down uh 
it blew my mind and and, and then it and was did you put, to bed. Oh, so you didn't do Jedi in the same night, so you ended on Empire. Ended on Empire because of time, you know, uh, took me like five hours and whatever. Yeah, yeah. And so I was in bed and then I think it was like seven hours. Couldn't, like, uh, couldn't sleep. Waited and I think I got up first thing breakfast, 6 a.m., 7 a.m., Saturday morning. Jedi went in. And within that space of time, I swear to you, Alex, my life changed. The line, if you look at like influences and diversions, there's where my life would have been if I didn't get that box set from my dad and where my life is getting it. And <clears throat> it went, it was an overnight obsession. And I didn't know that there were prequels being made because that information was new to, I didn't know that we were going to get one, two and three. And that was in production at the time because it was around 97, 98. So I'm getting into it and I'm like, I didn't have to wait 30, 20 years for the, for you know, or 15 years for Phantom Menace. I'm like, Fucking love the original trilogy. All my pocket money went on the action figures and the uh, power of the force for action figures. I had the shelf. I was just consuming Star Wars. I was reading the books, every video game. I was um, just losing my fucking mind. All my homework. It's so funny, dude. Like, it could be geography. And somehow I've linked it to Tatooine. <laughs> like this, I couldn't, it was like, it was disgraceful. Like every IT homework, every art project, every fucking English project, everything just went back there. I, I couldn't <laughs> stop. I, um, I remember my auntie um, who hates me. Uh, she, she thought <laughs> I was... She, Oh, she still does dislike, but I was never a favorite. And uh, Right, 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 right. And uh, she, she thought I had like i was developing weird um she was super concerned because she'd come over and i'd be in the garden air fighting with my qui-gon Jin lights like i just had lightsabers no one's there i'm just in the garden they're like where's rahul and i just be like <laughs> and, just learning to dwell. and then like now that i'm an actor I've kind of been like, ah, so it was all good. Cause they wonder, everyone wonders, why is he so good at fucking sword fighting and shit? And I was like, yeah. Um, but um, yeah, it was just an overnight obsession and, and it became comfort. Uh, everyone has a tough time at school. Um, and, and I was no exception and I was miserable. I was miserable socially. And there's a lot of reasons, puberty, all of that stuff. And I'd come home and whoop, VHS goes on. Uh, we're allowed to watch now i'm in high school we're allowed to watch vhs did you have a, this is what did you have a group of friends at school like were you part of a group of all like yeah. star wars though because that's it's, it's no, very they thing. It. oh they it hate just, it they we were still we are cl we're close to this day like the four of us who went to the same primary school high school mm. we've stuck together um they weren't fans they became fans when they were like late teens, like 16, 17, I kind of broke them a bit. And then they were like, all right, let's watch fun. And then they had to watch Phantom Menace Attack of the Clones. Um, <clears throat> not the best, but like now they're fully into it. They'll like, they watch Mandalorian and they'll text me and stuff. But, uh, but I was very much on my own as 11 year old, 12 year old where, where Star Wars was concerned. And they but you did have friends though. Cause that's the, that's the thing, isn't it? Like yeah. school is school can be shitty. At the, yeah, like, yeah. But I guess if you've got, comrades um yeah i still you know. had mates that were, were like this is fucking geeky mm -hmm. um i'd still get bashed for it but it was from a place of love and it was still my identity right um but the the career thing was it, it kind of like infiltrated me and i i so i started watching it and i wanted to be in that world so desperately like i'd come home from school girl i liked you know crushed my spirit or i you know got into a fight or the school's terrible whatever the fuck happened and then i'd come home put the vhs on and for two hours i'm gone i'm on that i'm on the millennium falcon i'm escaping the empire whatever and it just became this like escapism and i decided i was like i want to be in this world what's the closest to being in it oh well making it um and then I was like, well, I want to be a part of making something like this. I want people to feel the way I feel, feel now watching it. And um, that's what led to, um, <clears throat> that's what started me off with media production. And I wanted to work for ILM and I was super interested in, um, in, in special effects and, yeah. And and you've it's, it sounds like when you just mentioned like Phantom Menace and Attack of the Clones, and you, I think you said not the best, 
Is that not, how do you feel about them really? Is that an understatement? Not the best. I, I mean, I, you do, don't you? I love them. Yeah. More than the fucking Shining. No. <laughs> like, like, I, like, I do. I, do. I, I did love them. Did you love them? I like it for the, for the good parts. I love it for its flaws. It's, 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 I was having this conversation recently. I, if you take the story, if you just look at the outline, it's actually a good fucking story. Uh-huh. The execution's a little off, but the story's super interesting, you know. Um, and even the trade disputes are interesting and the blockades. Um, but but I, like, listen, I, 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 never, I never really had a problem with the, uh, the trade disputes and the fact that it's, like, it's all about like, not paying, taxing a planet mm-hmm. or at the start. I, I, I didn't mind that. And look, I, I do not hate Phantom Menace and Revenge of the Sith. Like, uh, I was right. actually genuinely impressed with. I was mm-hmm. like, this is incredible. Apart from No, which I'll never get over. Um, no, terrible. Yeah. But it's part of the charm. That's is what's it? happened for me. Yeah, it's become part of the charm. You like, not, it's, it's, but it's, it's sort of, do you not think you've sort of got someone, you've got this, you've got one of the greatest villains in cinema history in Darth Vader, mm. and, and in one scene, you've, you've robbed him of that legacy, like yeah. almost, like, oh, you, you've done a, a really good job of trying to. And it didn't have to be like that. It's like, you know, you watch Rogue One, you go, fucking hell, he's terrifying. Absolutely. That's possibly one of the scariest Darth Vader scenes I've ever seen. Yeah, ever. Yeah, I got why people were scared of Vader. I never got it in, even when I watched the originals as a 11 year old, he wasn't scary to me. Mm. Um, That never hit. Um, Rogue One, I was like, oh yeah, I wouldn't want to be trapped in the, you can't, yeah, that's a beast. It's weird, isn't it? That's being trapped with a bear that can force choke you. Um, Yeah, I never, yeah, Rogue One didn't, no, um, was it robbed? Look, I, I went through like, a whole kind of journey with the prequels which was i adored them as a kid i mean i was watching them when i think they came out i was 13 16 18 so something like that right so by the time i was an adult um and i was fully at drama school i got revenge of the sith so i was a little older and i still had issues with stuff but it was the right time to watch that one i was a very emotionally sensitive uh, teenager who I mean could have in another world become a fucking incel the way I was, I was so thin skinned and sad all the time and <laughs> why does no one fancy me um, at, at the time I saw Attack of the Clones so uh. that shit hit me like a fucking like ton of bricks I was like you know I'm haunted by the kiss you should never have given I would have said shit like that <laughs> at 14, 15 and Phantom Menace I was 11 and I just remember me and my sister came out. I think I was 11 or 12. Oh, no, maybe I was... No. Yeah, I'm fucking up my ages. But I was around that age, 12, 13 or whatever. And um, I just remember, like, me and my sister came out of the cinema. My parents picked us up. And we were like, the fight at the end. Darth Maul. Lights. Who knows mm-hmm. what the fuck happened for the first two hours. It just mm-hmm. ended on this note of just jewel of the fates in your ears. Yeah. I mean, I, I won't argue. Dizzy. I won't argue with that. That's the great. Is that that's yeah? That's probably the greatest lightsaber battle in the history of the franchise. I think I that mean, and the Empire Strikes Back for the emotional mm. when he well, first confronts Vader in the Carbonite Chamber and the lighting, oh, fucking, mm. like that's still number one. But Duel of the Fates is just on another level. And I don't know if you saw that. Did you see that clip of Filoni talking about Duel of the Fates? No. Uh, he it came it came about from the Mandalorian roundtable and he went uh-huh. you know why it's called Jewel of the Fates right well George set that up because at that moment there are three storylines there are three alternate storylines you've got and it's about what happens in the future it's fighting for Anakin's fate Anakin's fate is decided and the fate of the galaxy in that fight if Qui Gon wins. Anakin ends up with a mentor that is uh, older, more experienced, controlled, wiser. He's going to get the type of attention and care uh, a child going through the trauma that that child had been through needs probably wouldn't 
have been so emotionally unstable, probably would have handled things slightly better. We may not have had Darth Vader. If Darth Maul wins, both Jedis get wiped out, possibly Anakin dies. And if Obi-Wan comes out on top, you get a kid who doesn't really respect life forms. I mean, he calls, he says it, like he doesn't show respect for Jar Jar. When Qui-Gon goes back to Tatooine, Obi-Wan says, you know, why do I sense we've picked up another pathetic life form? That's Obi-Wan, who doesn't, who begrudgingly trains this kid he doesn't want to train. And that's where we end up with. And in that moment, that's the duel of the fates. And Filoni explains that at the round table. And I was just like, <laughs> have we misunderstood George? Because he's a fucking genius. Like, I even got goosebumps telling you that again. But like, yeah, I mean, I am a pre... I, like, I went through many different... I, I went through this, love him as a kid, love him when I saw him, mm. almost aged out of them and thought, oh, and started to see him. And I was like, this is fucking embarrassing, man. <laughs> and then came full circle and was like, no no it's okay like you can i, I still want to love I, I love them for i love them for their great part like there, there's some amazing stuff in there that happens some of the best um excuse me ooh, uh, some of the best kind of like cinema moments cinematic moments have happened in that movie the the helmet going on with the hiss and the happens yeah two minutes before the no and that's equally as good as that is bad <laughs> like it's the high highs and low lows of the prequels. Like there are so many like, peaks and troughs with that with that trilogy. Um, but one thing that's not spoken about enough, man, is <clears throat> particularly Attack of the Clones. It I was say, our this industry. is this is this is that this is the one that fascinates me a bit because I did leave it out of the list earlier, but I mentioned them because Attack of the Clones. I, I find that close to unwatchable. Like Phantom yeah. and Revenge. Are, <clears throat> are, I you know. I don't, I don't disagree with you. I think there is a lot to love in them, but Attack of the Clones, I, I, I couldn't believe what I was watching. I was just like, what is this? What's happened? This is, it's just a sprawling mess of mm. ugliness. I, I mean, I think that's the thing. It's not like, compared to the others, it's quite an ugly film, I thought. It's definitely aged the worst. Um, I, I personally felt that the movies got better in order. That was oh, really feeling. yeah because I'm a big of the closest... Obi-Wan fan, right? So I got this whole B side of just McGregor, mm. you know, ex- going to Camino and the you got the Django Fett fight with the asteroids. There was a lot more to there was a lot more sprinkles of excitement in there, yeah. Mm. And but the Anakin Padme stuff really just fucking drags that movie <laughs> down. But I also find it funny. Um, but Attack of the Clones changed our industry forever, and. It wasn't until I was on Bly and I was just sitting around YouTube and a documentary that I'd seen before, which was on the Attack of the Clones DVD, was on YouTube. And it was George talking about digital filmmaking. Yeah. And he then details what this camera that he, de- I think he developed with Panasonic because the technology didn't exist. If you watch The Phantom Menace, uh, one scene is digital, and it's when uh, you know it's uh, when he's patching up Jake Lloyd's got a cut, and he sn- steals a bit of his blood for the midi chlorian test. All of that scene, that shot outside, is the first digital scene. Uh, sorry, on a digital camera, and that was the test. And then Attack of the Clones was the we're going to do all of this digital. I'm confident. So Panasonic and George make this camera. And they talk about, well, what's this going to do for our industry? And he talks about Video Village. And you're going to be able to real-time watch on giant monitors. We can have multiple monitors for different departments that they're able to get live playback. Okay. We'll be able to edit that night. Um, We can do more takes because it's not as we have more storage. We don't have to worry about film. And I started thinking about it. And I was like, well, so in the old days, prior to George, the only person you've direct had to trust maybe one monitor and the cameraman. That meant hair, makeup, stunts. There are so many departments that are completely shut out of, of the final picture. That's why you get so many goofs in, in all the films and stuff because no one can watch unless you spotted it there and then. That's why that can happen. <clears throat> so Video Village, being able to have live playback with giant monitors, all of that stuff, the amount of time we have on set, the the how how cheap it is to shoot digital as opposed to on film 
um, how it's changed my, like while I was on set on Bly, I really had a moment where I looked around and I was like, wow, Attack of the Clones has influenced my working day. It's, it's unrecognizable. And, it's, and, and a lot of this is linked to those, that thing that he's talking about in 2002 or whatever it was, this is going to change how we make stuff. And I'm working on a set that's living proof of that. Um, doesn't, uh, that doesn't make uh, the sand scene as rough and coarse and irritating. And it, get, it doesn't make it any more easier to watch. But fuck me, what he did for cinema is ridiculous. And The Mandalorian's done the same thing. John Favreau yeah. and, and, and this technology, yeah. the volume. Oh, that's what Star Wars is. I get it. It's a vehicle. To, it takes our industry, puts us, uh, it takes us to the next level, except the sequels, which didn't do any of that. Yeah, that, that's a weird one, isn't it? I kind of, I don't know how I feel. I, I spent a little bit of time thinking about um, sort of what really happened there. And I, I think, you know, it's just a really interesting decision to start a story arc with uh, JJ and then go, Ryan, uh, feel free to just do whatever you like with this. And then JJ, if you could come back and finish it off, taking into account the fact that Ryan hasn't done a lot of what you set up in the first movie. Cool. That's a, that's your trilogy right there. <laughs> it's like, what? How? It's a very, it's, you know, when someone, you know, when you sit at school where you fold a picture, page yeah. three, someone yeah. draws the head. Consequences. The, the game. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 It's, it's wild. I, I mean, I don't know if you saw this. There was a, uh, I'm sure this is a, a thing. Daisy Ridley speaks about Rise of Skywalker. I think she spoke to Josh Gad. And she, and then the internet got very angry when she was like, oh, so when I was doing Rise of Skywalker, was that a good Daisy? That was an unintentional good. Anyway. That was actually um, quite good. I was impressed. Yeah. <laughs> it was the O. I was like, oh. Um, when she was doing uh, Rise of Skywalker, the conversation about her lineage changed during production while filming. She said, one minute, I was Obi-Wan's granddaughter. Another minute, I'm Palpatine's granddaughter. And it went, and JJ would just be like, so what am I playing today? And at that point, you're a nobody. We'll stick to the last Jedi. This is happening mm. while it's being shot, dude. Mm. And that says everything you need to know about the sequels. So it makes George look like fucking Martin Scorsese, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was, yeah. yeah. I don't know. I mean, I didn't really like, I didn't, I didn't love the, the, the last Jedi. I mean, obviously, it was better than the Rise of Skywalker, but it was just uh, I, uh, from that from that opening scene where because I thought they I thought Donald Gleason as Hux was genuinely scary in the Force Awakens, and in that opening scene of the Last Jedi, they they took a very scary character and turned him into a, a comic. Uh, Is you that know, the, the, uh, the your mama joke? Yeah, yeah. It's the bit where it's it's the bit that belonged in Guardians of the Galaxy, not a fucking Star Wars movie, where oh, he's yeah. like, can he I hear me? It. Why yeah. can't he hear me? Why is, is this thing on? It's like, what is happening? How is this happening? Yeah, this Poe should have done like this <laughs> in the cockpit. Uh, yeah, you're right. Guardians of the Galaxy, absolutely. They, they got it. Everything got crossed. Mandalorian, on the other hand, look, Mandalorian oh. has peaks and troughs for sure. Mm. And, I, and I, I fucking love that show. And I love everything about it. I love the... The, the thing is, you can have bad Star Wars. Of course you can. That happens. If you're a Star Wars fan, you have to get used to the mixed bag, the revels that is Star Wars. <laughs> you may get the coffee one, right? Because what, you're telling me every EU book was a hit? Are you telling me that the Christmas specials and the Ewok movies and the video games we had? Mm. Yeah, we had Knights of the Old Republic, but we also had Super Bombad Racing. Like, we've, it's... <laughs> It's a mixed bag, you know? So if you're a Star Wars fan, you got to get used to uh, high highs and low lows. Mm -hmm. That's it. It's, when you got a franchise that big, it's going to fucking happen. Um, it's really hard to swallow. And the thing is as well, I could, you can't be mad at the sequels. If you're, you know, I, I don't like the sequels. People don't like the prequels. Like... I don't know anyone who like, if you like all nine, well, holy shit. Like <laughs> I, I have so much respect for you. I, I feel like you must love everything. Like nothing is bad. But anyway, 
yeah even with the mandalorian like there are episodes that eh, but still it's made with love and that's the mm. difference like with star wars when star wars is bad as long as it was made with love um <clears throat> i'm okay with it like you tried and you, we could tell you still love what you do and you love these this sandbox you can feel that with the games you can feel that with some of the books even not the great ones but i think the problem with the sequels where it became very apparent to people they were like do you even love this do you even care yeah. That was the problem because even you couldn't look prequels, whether you like them or not, are still word of God. They're biblical. If George said it happened, it fucking happened. If midi chlorians are real, the midi chlorians are real. If Jake, if, if Anakin had a bowl haircut and said, yippee, <laughs> that's what he did. That's word of God. So whether you, you can dispute it all you want, he said it, it's done. The sequels yeah. weren't. And it was a very weird place to be because the sequels aren't the word of God. Mm. They're fan yeah. films. I, uh... Yeah. I mean, George Lucas does also say on the, the Phantom Menace making of documentary that comes on the, uh, was it the Blu-ray or the DVD? Probably both. Oh, DVD. Uh, yeah. He does say, he does say uh, what's, uh, what's so exciting about uh, Jar Jar Binks is that we've never had a character this funny in the Star Wars universe. Oh. <laughs> so, so those are his words. God, God he, said that. And, God also uh, <laughs> said when he watched it, said, I may have gone too far. <laughs> Do you remember that? <laughs> it's the best part of that DVD. They watched the final cut. Rick McCullum and I think Ben Burtt's there and George Lucas and they and it rolls and it finishes and you have their reaction and he goes, I think I may have gone too far in this <laughs> Yeah. Uh Hey man, I'm gonna. Uh, you probably have stuff to do, and no. um, and uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, what 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 have you got? Are you going to leave the house, or have you got how many boxes of cigarettes have you got left? Do you get to go out? Are you six. going out? I'm good for six days. <laughs> uh, no, I I am going to go out. I am. I I'm actually in the process of one of the uh, things that I still haven't got used to is traveling. Um, I haven't unpacked from midnight mass. Uh, okay. I haven't unpacked from I Zombie. <laughs> <laughs> that finished in 2018 20, I, yeah i wrapped filming 2018 like okay. i because i keep getting pulled away my shit just stacks up and so i'm finally doing i'm like a hoarder at this point so um i'm going to donate today today i've put aside old books i've read i'm i'm having a complete clear out um so i'm going to be around doing charitable stuff I'm not. Nice. I'm just clearing out, really. Charity's <laughs> a bonus. I think that's nice. It's I, the charity shop's closer to my house than the skip. <laughs> <laughs> Which one are you going to? Is it, what's the, this one? I put a tweet out asking for locals because I don't really know them in my area. And um, there's a few savers. There's uh, out of the closet is another one. Yeah. There's, a, there's a few options. Um, so gonna... Is there Wasteland? Wasteland's another one, I think, around there. Is, is it? On... I think Wasteland, Wasteland is Wasteland. I think it's called Wasteland. I just want. I, I'm looking at you. What I wanted, right? Maybe you I'm wrong. go Tesco. You just got mm -hmm. the bins, and you just anonymous. You just shovel your old clothes in the bins. Yeah, yeah. They yeah, don't yeah. have that here. Maybe because people put fucking shit in them or something. I don't know. But like, I I just want to do that. I don't want to actually go out and talk to people. <laughs> <laughs> I want. I won't lie. I'm, there was a uh, part of the conversation. There, I got a bit worried about you spending all your time on your own. Ben Howard but, Hughes, man. It's, it's yeah. yeah, I am for sure. But you know, I'll always need cigarettes. Uh, exactly. So, and Mike, you know, he'll have to, he'll dig me out <laughs> from wherever I am and shave me, get me to lose some weight and stuff. He'll, he'll always he'll always get me out of there. <laughs> And uh, yeah, you got to keep whispering about Mike Flanagan doing a Bioshock game, like the Bioshock movie. That would be incredible. Series, Dude. whatever. And the um, Star Wars horror that I want, which is like the book where a, an alien virus infects a Star Destroyer and the storm, it's like, you know what I mean? So it's mm. aliens, Star Wars with stormtroopers, <laughs> not Marines with Mike Flanagan and me I'd as take, the lead. I, that sounds fucking... Look at this. Look, I'd take anything... I saw the aliens. Related. I saw As soon as I saw yeah, Vasquez yeah, yeah. there and stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. That's the greatest sci-fi movie anywhere, ever made. You can keep your Star Wars. Aliens. Oh! <clears throat> Been getting into Gundam. 
Have you really? Yeah, like as a, as a history thing, seeing the mm. first mech, watching the old 70s car- cartoon, which has aged poorly and, and which makes it fucking amazing. <laughs> they, just, they just slap every... It's, it, there is some toxic masculinity going on and mm. it makes me laugh because it's aged so bad. And like if, if, a, if a woman's hysterical in it, they just backhand... But then also they backhand the dudes if they're not like manly enough. There's just a lot of slaps and really weird toxic, <laughs> man. but in wrapped up in this amazing historic show. So it's been a yeah, I've been rewatching that. For fun. You must you must have to be able to detect. I mean, like some of the some of the real diehard Star Wars fans online are kind of like it got a bit dark uh, at certain points. I remember le- letters. Troubling letters that were written to Disney and Kathleen Kennedy about exactly what she should do with her series. And uh, yeah, so. well, I uh, being a gamer, I worked in a video game shop. So I, I worked Game Station Wembley was one of my first jobs. Um, and so being around video games, which before Marvel and Twitter and people like they were the shittiest community in person. So I had to just see the, the toxicity of the gaming industry. And I still see it to this day. I, I don't think, I don't think star Wars or Marvel or anything comes close to what the video game industry experiences uh, with that kind of crap. Mm. And it's a medium that I adore and I love people. I have so many loved ones in that industry. Um, who put up with that nonsense every day, man. So I've learned to still not let that destroy what I love. Mm. And the same goes for the star Wars community. Cause if I start getting into that, like I, you, you've got, I've got to find a way to tune it out. I mean, these guys really think when they at star Wars or, or, uh, or Disney that the, they made Kathleen Kennedy's phone buzz. It's just some like 20 year old social media account, like managed, like who's just some intern. who's like, go die oh <laughs> and they really think that like i remember when i when i i i said call turfs cunts or whatever i was uh, you know, gonna go at you know turfs and they were at in netflix like they were at in my boss so i was at in netflix too because they were like is this the kind of person you employ and i know i know i know some of the people who have these accounts and they're just these 20 year olds who are like cool thanks we'll pass oh. it on anyway Oh man! Um, well, listen, uh, I cannot wait to see Midnight Mass. Very excited about that. Mm. Um, still not got a release date. Don't expect you to tell me. I'm sure it'll just come out in due course. I look forward to reading that. I'll tell you excited. what. I will 100 percent be down for a chat after you've watched it, and we can talk spoilers. <gasps> I'd love to break it down with you if you're down. That would yes. Let's do that. That would be yeah. amazing. Yeah. I'd love that. I'd love sure? that. I'm very excited. Hey, uh, dude, have a wonderful day. And you uh, thank you for your time, man. Thank you, Alex, man. It's been a pleasure. And the shining fucking rules. Yeah. Dr. Sleep's better. <laughs>